this for granted. Right about now, I'll be reading the key, the profile of our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is Patricia Adusi Oku, the executive director of the Ghana Data Protection Commission. She is a seasoned privacy practitioner in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors globally, and, is the, and currently the president of the Network of African Data Protection Authority. Now, this was a platform she campaigned for and had campaigned, she's ably Mr. Femi Daniels, who would be taking the keynotes on her behalf as she's unavoidably absent. Patricia has over 20 years of experience in data protection and has over the years worked on several data protection implementation projects. Before her most recent appointment, she was an EU GDPR consultant, where she was a senior executive consultant and coach on the EU GDPR preparation and implementation. Some of her previous appointments include the head of data protection at the London 2012 Olympic Games and global director for data protection and privacy at the World Vision International Security Operation, head of data protection in London, CTS team manager, Office of the National Statistics. Patricia holds a master's in international public policy, pol political science and government, and an MBA in project management and consultancy. And she is a certified information privacy manager issued by the globally recognized International Association of Privacy Professionals, IAPP, certified practitioner in European Union General Data Protection Regulation, the EU's GDPR. She enjoys reading, traveling, and charity work. With a digital clap, let's welcome Mr. Femi Daniel as he takes the presentation on her behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, the moderator. Can you hear me well, please? Can you hear me? I'll, can, can you hear me clearly? All right, thank you so much. Uh, yes, yes. So, um, Madam Patricia Poku uh, uh, actually just became the president of the Network of African Data Protection Authorities just about three months ago, and my I am I represent the network in Nigeria, and I am also I was also a campaign director, and. Um, uh, on she she had delegated me to actually represent her not that she takes this very important conference you know lightly but she is currently in morocco uh, morocco hosts the secretariat of the of the network and she's trying to put some things in place for 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 the network to kick start i've been talking to her throughout the night but uh, incidentally the time zone was not going to favor her and she didn't just want to do a shoddy job so she said i should please read her, her, her speech. So I will just be going straight to read her speech. Uh, all protocols duly observed. We, uh, we recognize the presence of uh, Professor Abiola Sani, a distinguished professor of law and an and international scholar in the area of taxation and now into technology. Also the, the various distinguished guests that are currently in attendance and those that will still be joining. On behalf of the Network of Africa Data Protection Authorities, I am grateful for the opportunity to deliver the keynote address for the second Africa Data Security Conclave. I am confident and positive that conversations like this would set up the tone for a truly data compliant Africa and strengthen our resolve to ensure that the security of our personal data as individuals and organizations alike are guaranteed and is not compromised during as we are now going into the era of more engagement in the trading between within the continent. A major focus area of, for my presidency at the network is to harmonize relations across the data protection regimes of various jurisdictions so that there is a unity of purpose and better synergy for African countries in the promotion of the unified front as far as data security is concerned. It is imperative at this point to, that individuals and organizations alike are more aware of data security risks that continue to emerge on a daily basis and how ignorance 
can no longer be excused nor tolerated. The data protection authorities across the African continent need to rise to the challenge of combating the hydra headed monster of cybercrime, uh, information security breaches, and abuse of personal data. The theme of this year's conference is very significant, and it is a and I um, it's also a thing of joy and pride for me to say that this is the first cross continental. Um, conference that I will be addressing since I assumed the chairmanship, the presidency of the Network of African Data Protection Authorities. And I thank the organizers for inviting me and the network to speak. So the theme for this year is data security considerations for a continental free trade area, the challenges and the prospects. This theme brings to the fore the fact that there is no real assurance of seeing the reality of the resolutions of the AFICTA in the absence of data security. After the, the, the COVID-19 and the year 2020 was a very trouble, uh, troublous period for the whole world, but Africa started on the right note in 2020 by kickstarting the AFICTA. And I am proud to say that the AFICTA is the largest um, the largest multilateral trading organization, and it has the a very huge potential, knowing seeing the huge um, potential that Africa has. And um, therefore, the issue of data, exchange of data, uh, is going to be a major thing that will be oft repeated in the course of the implementation of the AFICTA. A major idea behind the AFICTA was to ensure that there is ease of trade in goods and services among African countries, and it is inevitable that significant amount of data will be exchanged among these countries in the process. In the absence of data security, mutually beneficial exchanges will not be guaranteed, thus defeating the purpose of trade itself. And we need to we realize that trade is no longer and selling like we used to have. It is now, digital trade is now amounting to about $11 trillion globally, and Africa's digital trade is rising. Therefore, we are actually addressing the right issues at this particular conference. The Beyond implementation of data protection laws, it is pertinent to focus on enforcement of data protection measures in Africa member states. This would ensure that no jurisdiction in Africa find itself suffering from the failure of another because the, the we are strong, uh, we are all as strong as our weakest link. It is time to wield the big stick and ensure that affected member states that lack effective data protection measures are appropriately sanctioned until they conform to the continental uniform standards. <clears throat> personal data has also been, the personal data transfer has also been a major cause of concern for many African countries as personal data are carelessly transferred across Africa and other continents without the knowledge or consent of data subjects. And this has led to various forms of crime, including identity theft, data manipulation, large scale fraud, among others. Now, we at the Network of Data, Africa Data Protection Authorities, are actually poised to change the narrative. The time for um, just talking is now ended. We want to actually present an Africa that is unified in purpose and that is willing to solve its problem having with the requisite tools. And that is what my tenure at the network would stand for. It is sad to know that Africa remains a very notorious continent for the propagation of various cyber crimes, but this would, would gradually and is now we are facing these issues headlong and it is going to be, we are no longer going to be complacent. We are going to band together across the 54 African countries and all our partners within the continent and outside to be able to achieve a cleaner image for Africa in the di global digital space. And as the president of the network, I'm also committed to seeing the possibility, pushing the agenda of having an African single jurisdiction for the purpose of data transfer. What this implies would be that where there is a transfer of data within the continent, so long as we have the requisite um, common standards, any transfer from Lesotho to Ghana to Mauritius, this should be regarded as a single continent, a single jurisdiction. That implies that 
even some of the lesser um, endowed countries economically can actually be a safe haven for data storage. And it would also help uh, Africa to be able to have a single and common front to deal with some of the big te the challenges of the big technology organizations that, are, that, that sometimes tend to take Africa for granted. We need to rise to the challenge to ensure we protect our own data space and only then can we indeed be our brother's keeper we need to forge better alliances and partnerships and indeed grow stronger together with or without the presence of all our other counterparts from other continents but i would also mention that as president of the network i have the the, the requisite connections network and um, and and the wherewithal to be able to bring like-minded partners across the world to help to support our journey to a better data maturity on the continent. I'm certain that with a firm resolve to ensure paradigm shift in no distant time, we will set the pace for the world at large as far as data security is concerned. I, I want to specially commend the organizers of this conference, the Taxi Technology Limited, and their affiliate brands and all the supporting organizations. I also appreciate the National Information Technology Development Agency, which is the current supervisory authority for data protection in Nigeria. Nigeria has been a very strong partner and a strong supporter to my candidacy, and we have been working together. And I look forward to working with all the, uh, uh, the, the various stakeholders in the Nigerian ecosystem. I was the... I chaired the first data protection expo that was actually conducted in 2021, uh, hosted by NIDA, the National IT Development Agency. And um, I, am, I must say that I'm very impressed with what is going on in Nigeria. And um, I, I look forward to working with the data protection compliance organizations and other stakeholders in Nigeria, including tax tech and other, uh, other, uh, other the people with vision for us to be able to move at the uh, African agenda forward. I assure you of the full support of the network of African data protection authorities under my leadership. And uh, we are in this together and indeed we shall win together. I wish you a great time in the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Femi Daniel, for that wonderful keynote address read on behalf of our keynote speaker, Patricia Adusi Koku. So in Koku, in reverse order, we'll be having our opening remark as Professor Abiola Sani is available. So I'd like to read his citation again. Professor Abiola Sani is a solicitor and advocate of the Supreme Court of Nigeria with over three decades post-fall experience. He is also a professor of law at the University of Lagos. He is a Fulbright Fellow and a holder of a doctorate degree of the University of Lagos in commercial law, where he occupies an endowed chair as the Lagos State Professor of Tax Aid Technologies Limited as the chairman of the board of directors with a digital round of applause. Let's welcome Professor Abdullah Sani for his opening remarks. Over to you, Professor Abdullah Sani. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Olufemi Daniel. Thanks for filling the gap before I came, uh, I came on board. Uh, depending on uh, which part of the globe you are joining us, I like to warmly welcome you. And I say that uh, we are delighted to have you on call at this particular hour. There are a few recognitions I'd like to make, starting with uh, MIDA for the institutional support. It continues to give uh, tax tech. I also like to appreciate uh, Patricia Adushe Poku, who uh, is ably represented by Olufemi Daniel. Uh, she is uh, an emerging powerful, strong voice on data protection in Africa. I also recognize each and every resource person who will be speaking at this conference or playing one part or the other at this event. As you are aware, this is the second edition 
of the Africa Data Security Conclave. The theme for this year's conference is data security considerations for a continental free trade area, the challenges and prospects. The event is put together by Tax Technology Limited, Tax Compliance Organization in Nigeria. We have been a pay setter for organizing meaningful and fruitful conversation at national and continental levels on data security. It is appropriate, to, uh, it is apposite at this stage to recognize two bright, dynamic young minds who are behind all this. They are, by the force of their intellect and uncommon drive, poised to be the change that Africa desperately needs. Africa should watch out for the duo of Bideni Olumide and then Oyeyemi Oke. As you may recall, last year meetings conference on personal data protection and cybersecurity action points for the rise of African knowledge economy brought to the fore novel and thinking issues, which can deepen the knowledge and the practice of data protection and governance across Africa. This year, we ride further and we are poised to delve into the statutory and contractual realms of after and the data security implication it, be, it behoves. Just as it is globally, Africa digital economy will become, will continue to grow, perhaps more rapidly on the strength of its youthful and urban population. So also with the anticlimax of cyber threats and crime. To be forewarned is to be forehand. Hence, this year's intervention by tax tech and its uh, allies. There is a need to embrace the present, peer into the future, and embrace both with the preparation and the dedication that it requires. The whole idea of a conclave is for us to come together within a very short period, have a meaningful conversation, and come out with a meaningful solution, which will trigger policy reforms, legislative uh, framework, and also the implementation strategies. So it is my hope and expectation that we will build on the successes of the Made in Conference and then set agenda for the next phase of uh, implementation of data protection as it implicates APTA. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you to this conference and I hope you have a fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. Over to you, I'm done. Thank you very much, Professor Abiola Sani for that heartwarming opening remark. We are grateful and it's so good to see you again. So right about now, we're going to our first panel session. Now this panel session will be talking about the emergence and implementation of a uniform framework for personal data security in Africa. Recommendations from the first Africa Data Protection Conclave. Remember that I said that most of the things we'll be talking about today are based on the resolutions from the maiden edition of the Africa Data Security Conclave. Now, the speakers in this panel session includes Mr. Olufemi Daniel, Mr. Oyeyemi Oke, Mr. Olumide Oshun Dolore, Mrs. Esther Lugwe Mengi, Taufik Babayeju, and this session is moderated by Ronke Atkinson. So let me read the profile of Ronke Atkinson. Ronke has vast experience and knowledge in data protection and has advised clients globally on implementation strategies to ensure compliance with relevant regulatory policies. She is a passionate and experienced marketing and customer relationship manage, manage, management professional with diverse industry knowledge acquired from working in the financial automo automotive and travel sectors across Europe, Middle East and Africa with a digital club. Let's welcome Ronke Atkinson as she moderates this first panel session. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to um, further introduce um, panelists. Um, hosts um, already provided a summary uh, in terms of who's going to be present. Um, apologies, Mr. Day, um, because he's on the unavoidable, but it is my hope that by the time we to discuss, he's actually able to. Morning, Esther. What a pleasure to meet you virtually. Uh, it's a pleasure. Can you see me? Um, I can't see you oh, yet. Okay. Work on my on my video, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm just gonna um, take everyone through your profile while you're working on the video. So, Esther, you are the technical and data analytics specialist of Forensic Africa. Esther has worked with the United Nations headquarters in Africa, UNDP in Somalia, Nexia SJ, IPP Media as well as Equity Bank, to name a few. Esther has a degree in Information Systems and Technology. She is a CCNA, CISA, CEH, and is currently working on her CFIP. She is an entrepreneur, an innovator, she's a product developer, and she's developed and commercialized several systems and applications during her career. In 2017, Forbes listed her as one of the 30 most promising young entrepreneurs in Africa. And she was also named one of the top 100 women in cybersecurity in Africa. So a massive digital clap. We still can't see you yet, um, Esther. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Okay. So I'm going to move on to, um, we've heard from him already. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him. Um, I'd like to go over the profile for Mr. Olufemi Daniel. So, Femi, welcome. And thank you so much for standing in for Patricia. Thank Talk you very much, Ronke. It was very much a short notice, so much appreciated. Femi is a seasoned lawyer. He is also the desk officer, NDPR, and head of regulations and monitoring and compliance at the National Information Technology Development Agency, which we all know popularly as NIPTA. Femi has a passion for technology, startups, open banking, social re-engineering through innovative regulations. He's also an author, book entitled Introduction to Computer Law in Nigeria was published in 2015. He is a member at Open Government Partnership Implementation Committee, IT Projects Clearance Committee, National Virtual Currency Committee, amongst several others as well. So I've got somebody that can advise us on policy development. Thank you so much for your presence today. And, oh, welcome, Mr. Ulumide. I see that you have been able to join us. So digital clap for you as well. Um, okay. Well, welcome. I'm glad you could make it. So Lumide is a graduate of the University of Lagos. He is currently the team lead of the Intellectual Property and Technology Practice Group in Baumwo and Igodalo Law Firm. His specialities include intellectual property and information technology law, property law, construction law, administration of estates, provision of company secretarial services, and negotiation and preparation of concession agree agreements for PPP projects. So I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. We commence discussions. Thank you. The next panelist I'm going to introduce um, is our very own Mr. Oyeyemi Oke. Oyeyemi holds EU GDPR certification and he advises clients 
compliance with the NDPR. Oyemi has advised a variety of clients on data protection in Nigeria, and he's been involved in over 50 data protection audits for clients in various sectors, such as financial services, FMCG, information technology companies, and also professional services. So welcome, Oyemi. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Thank you, Ronke. Good morning, everybody. And last but not least, our final panelist is Mr. Taufik Babayeju. Welcome and good morning. Taufik is a seasoned management and technology professional with over 20 years of experience and expertise in business transformation, strategy and innovation, technology consulting, project program and portfolio management, change management, and learning and development. He has had the privilege of managing several multi-million dollar portfolios, and he has led high impact transformation projects and programs. During his career, he's developed extensive leadership and management capabilities, whilst delivering value and solutions across different sectors, such as telecoms, IT, finance, government, development, a Greek health, education, and the SME sector. Prior to iCentra, he worked as head technical operations at IC Tech. He later joined MTEL as a telecom specialist and eventually rose to become a senior project manager. Taufik also holds an MBA from Lagos Business School and like Mr. Daniel is also an author. So, Taufik, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, just to set the scene, give a little bit of um, you know preamble before going into the um, recommendations. Um, I think it's important to have a little bit of a recap. What were the recommendations from the previous Africa data? protection conclave. And then I'm going to open the floor um, up to our panelists, um, you know, to have this discussion. So as a little bit of background, um, things that our audience are, you know, probably very well aware of, but I don't want to assume knowledge. In Africa, obviously, there are many countries that have seen a rise in reports of digital threats and malicious cyber activity. This includes sabotage public infrastructure losses from digital fraud and illicit financial flows. And national security breaches involving espionage and intelligence theft by militant groups. In Africa alone in 2017, the value of um, cyber threats is estimated to be over 3 billion with Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa um, suffering the biggest losses. Addressing these vulnerabilities requires a greater commitment to cybersecurity. This requires enforceable policy safeguards, risk prevention, and the management approaches along with technologies and infrastructure that can protect each country's cyber environment, individual and corporate end user assets, as well as continental policies. In the last two decades, Africa has continued to witness phenomenal growth in internet penetration and the use of ICT. As the African continent continues to embrace technological innovation, and the related to critical ICT network infrastructure in the continent, as well as the safeguarding of the fundamental rights of Africans through the protection of their personal data, especially data that's shared online. One such concern is personal data security, which becomes more crucial as huge amounts of sensitive personal data. Increasingly, 
separated across the continent. At the sub-regional level, the ECOS community adopted a directive on fighting cybercrime in August 20, 2011. When the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, COMESA, adopted a model cybercrime law in October 2011. The Southern African Development Community, SADC, also adopted a model law on computer crime and cybercrime in March 2012. On top of the echelon of the personal data protection of adopted in June 2014 by the African Union. Additionally, some African states have established national legal and policy frameworks for cybersecurity as we speak security governance. And it makes evidence of Africa's efforts to promote the development of a secure information society. Notwithstanding the success of the convention to a great extent, can not only be determined by the number of EU members states that eventually ratify the convention, but also by the extent to which it can serve as a viable legal instrument for cyber into what specific recommendations came out of um, the previous data protection noted. The first being the need to raise awareness of data protection laws across organizations with, with within individuals. The next is whose responsibility is data protection anyway? It's currently seen less so when authorities offer incentives for compliance perhaps. A very comprehensive legal framework based on human rights. There needs to be more synergy across African countries between consumer protection authorities as well as data protection authorities. And as we talk about synergy across African countries, we're talking about you know, such different cultures, such different levels of development. You know, is this something that's going to be straightforward? Um, you know. And that there's a need of indigenous tools to address gaps in data protection and cyber security in. Hi, everyone. Hi, Esther. Hi, my, my network has been acting up. So this brings the question of, are we ready? Is Africa ready for, for, for uniformity? Is, is our network supposed to be acting the way it should be acting? Or is our government allocating more resources into something else compared to internet, when you speak about internet, when you speak about data, and the whole uh, security area comes about, yeah? So um, I'm so happy, first of all, to be part of the panel in this very interesting matter. And as um, uh, I was introduced before, I'm from Tanzania. And we have all seen or all heard how our country acts differently compared to other African countries. Let's say for now in Tanzania, we have a cyber crime act, whereby it's not more about protecting the people rather than silencing people. 
I can give you a scenario whereby you're not supposed to share, to, to reshare a photo that has been sent to you. Whether it's good or bad, if, if someone sends you a WhatsApp photo, let's say you're not supposed to reshare, it's illegal in Tanzania. So that came about. Was the lightning green? Hello? Yeah, so that, that came about, uh, I think the Cybercrime Act was um, introduced right before the election, and the main parties didn't want circulation of various materials, so they had to create a Cybercrime Act that would silence, more of silencing people. So this brings me to a question that um, when we speak of uniformity, each country has its own laws and it has its own processes and procedures on how it practices um, 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 safety less in terms of security. So when we speak of uniformity, we need to have different stakeholders, apart from the government, having their own set of laws and make sure data within those sectors is protected. Let's say banks. If banks could have a uniform agreement on how to secure the systems and data of clients, then later on, maybe the government will follow suit. We have the film industries, we have different, different industries. So if we start with uniformity, we would start from different sectors, then come to, 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 to the government as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Okay. okay, can I lend my thoughts? Yes, definitely. Okay, um, I mean, looking at the sub theme, which uh, we intend to discuss, or which we are discussing this morning, which has to do with uh, uniform framework for enforcement. Um, I think uh, I, the, the good place to start from will be from the Malabu Convention itself. Uh, because initially, uh, my thoughts were that, do we need a treaty such as the EU GDPR uh, in order to achieve uniformity? And I struggle to answer yes. Why I struggle to answer yes is because of what has happened or examining uh, the experience with the Malabo Convention on one hand, and also perhaps the contents of the Malabo Convention in itself, uh, because um, I do not think we need to duplicate efforts on the continent with regards to having a separate data protection treaty. I think the Malabo Conventions, particularly uh, part two of it, actually provides copiously for what I would call the broad principles on data protection. Now, we are about eight years after uh, the Malabo Convention, then the question is how well have we fared um, as of today, or perhaps uh, as at uh, early this year, we say have just about uh, less than uh, 20 signatories uh, to the convention, uh, about five ratifications, and um, in a country, in a continent that has over 50 countries. Now, the issue for me is in order to achieve uniformity, we need to encourage ourselves uh, as um, fellow African states on the need or the importance of what we stand to gain as a continent on data protection or cybersecurity or having a uniform framework for cybersecurity and also uh, the encouragement of free trade within the continent. I think both are coterminous because one uh, largely trade uh, is uh, technology driven. Uh, it involves exchange of information uh, whether personal or not. And if we are supposed to have a free trade continent, 
speaking on data protection issues and also having uh, a uniformity around what our cyber security practices should be should uh, for the lack of better expression i would say should not even be uh, a, a source of debate as we have it as of today now my thoughts are that uh, rather than we have um, a separate um, data protection uh, treaty uh, i think we can use what we have with the malabo convention i think uh, that, is sufficient, that is sufficient <laughs> That is sufficient for us to be able to uh, work with as uh, African nations. Uh, and a, again, if we decide to have a separate convention on data protection, the question will be that what happens to the countries, to the few less than 15 countries or about 15 countries that already have data protection legislation uh, within their uh, national laws. And uh, interestingly, even um, in Nigeria as of today, we are seeing states having uh, or making propositions to have their separate uh, data protection laws. For example, uh, I'm aware that the Lagos State uh, House of Assembly is considering having its uh, data protection law. So in order to preserve what we have as of now, uh, the encouragement should be that, uh, I mean, flowing from one of the recommendations from the last conclave is that uh, we should ensure that uh, states have, I mean, nation states have uh, or infuse data protection principles uh, from the Malabo Convention into their national laws. And uh, perhaps we would see an improvement. Now, um, I mean, in the last one year, perhaps we may not have seen a lot of changes, but uh, one of the things I think um we should be looking at uh, as uh, African nations is to form alliances. Uh, definitely uh, the challenges in some states are different from others. Some are perhaps uh, in a better state as compared to others, particularly on cyber security and uh, data protection issues. Uh, those uh, countries who have perceived or what I can say uh, who have a better, uh, cybersecurity and data protection regime should look to form alliances with um, the states that do not have, uh, because I personally, I, I am a, a, an advocate of what I call uh, African solutions for African uh, uh, countries. Uh, and I think we will be able to make a lot of progress along those lines. I think I've spoken so much and I would allow others to speak. Henry, thank you so much. Um, I just want to make a comment. I know that we have a little bit of interference on the line, so my apologies. I, it's distracting um, speakers, so um, do forgive the glitches. This is the nature of the beast um, that we're dealing with. Um, I also noticed that there's a little bit of a delay, um, so we need to sort of just be a little bit um, cautious of that uh, and um, to make sure that people don't end up sort of speaking on top of one another. Um, I want to um, direct the question to um, Femi Daniel. You know, I asked that sort of key question of what shifted. Um, and, you know, if others, um, you know, would like to sort of respond individually to that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, but Femi, I know you've got some thoughts, um, specific thoughts on this, and I'd love to, you know, hear from you. Thank, thank you very much, Ronke and um, Esther. Welcome to Nigeria, virtually. <laughs> and I mean, it was, I mean, it was many of the things that have been said, uh, the reality has shifted. And I think it's a very important question because uh, personally, I like to always look for little positive steps in the in the right direction because um, many times we get bogged down with the things that are not working that we lose sight of the things that are working and then we feel that nothing is working and it actually kills innovation and progress so in the last since the last conclave and now 
some things have happened across the continent, which I think I can just quickly go over. Number one, while the conclude was being held, since March of last year, there was the framework, organization framework, where the framework was concluded. We looked at the economic indicators, the social indicators, the legal indicators for and, uh, and for harmonization. That framework was concluded, and of course, it had various stakeholders. The next step was to be for the framework to be tested. And that framework was tested in Ghana, Morocco, Mauritius, Gabon, and Zambia, representing the five zones of Africa. After for 20, actually the initial plan was for all the other countries in Africa for the framework to be tested in, you know, among them. But this year, the Secretariat were able to get about 20 countries and Nigeria joined other countries to get that to be tested. So what the framework does, what that is a kind of a survey, kind of a questionnaire that would, you need to respond to very detailed questions and provide evidence to support your answers. So in fact, when we were responding to Nigeria's uh, questions, there were some queries that the, the, um, the facilitators actually sent to us that we need to respond to and take back to them. Now, these are some of the progress that we have, um, that we have seen. And um, about 32 countries in Africa now have one form of data protection law uh, and then related to cyber security law of the other. Within the year also, South Africa's um, POPIA, that's a personal uh, POPIA, they call it POPIA, I've forgotten the full meaning now, but POPIA actually had two branches. One is the information side and the other is the data side. The information regulator um, uh, side had actually began some since about 2013 or, or so, but the data protection aspect of POPIA did not take effect until this year because the reality of COVID and a lot of the digitization and digitalization is actually kicking in. So the, the South African parliament decided that it was time for POPIA to take effect. But one of the things that have happened with POPIA is POPIA is the only act in the whole world. One of the few, I think the only act, I think I've checked a, couple of others, but that has, that protects not just personal, but you are expected to also protect the corporate data. And that has become a big challenge for interpretation and harmonization of data protection laws. Because if you take um, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and maybe probably Mauritius in the, in the Southern side of Africa, those are the leaders. And um, the, of course, even South Africans are actually having a challenge with the issue of making corporate data to become, to be protected, uh, like a kind of data protection. Within the year also, we have had a draft continental data policy framework. What that policy framework is to do, I, I don't know if time will permit me either now or later, to actually provide some more context to that particular draft continental privacy framework, which is going to be considered at the, at the African Union Convention holding later in the year. What that framework is trying to say, is trying to do is to put together some of the learnings that we have had, and you know, in the last couple of years, some of the private sector, because working in with Smart Africa, which is kind of more of private sector, um, you know, a, a approach to, to continental integration. Then we have the AU sector at itself. And there's some of the learnings that some of us have been sharing in some of the fora that the, the framework is ready. It has been debated. Countries have also been called together to debate some of the, we've debated some of the provisions and the, and the tone and the tone. So the Secretariat is expected to actually do a final draft, which will now be ratified at the convention. Because it's a framework, it is not going through all the, the international um, protocol of you know, ratification and accession and all that. So it's a framework that each country needs to actually look at how their data protection um, you know, regulation is going, and then they can 
light on to that. Also, within the and uh, that within the year also, the broadband penetration had, has risen within last year and this year. Uh, you know, has risen. Of course, we are, we know there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of policy somersaults here and there, but we must not lose sight of the fact that some things have actually risen. The the last mile, you know, may, there is a lot of broadband on the shores of Africa, but the last mile issues were the challenges. You know, for Nigeria, the 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 right of way challenge was resolved. And um, governors, rather than um, you know putting thousands able to connect the interland, there is now this uh, you know um, the, by policy changing the policy, reducing the taxes on right of ways, we have been able to extend you know um, broadband into the interland, and which is you know is also showing in the figures because if you look at the numbers, if you are not looking at the headlines, but if you are looking at the numbers, you will know that some things are actually moving in the right direction. Another thing that has been happening is that many African countries are now beginning to pay attention, not just to information technology, but to digital economy. And that is raising the awareness. But I think the biggest win for Africa in the last one year is the fact that AFICTA has actually started, its sectorial is in Ghana, and things, a lot of things are actually happening. And I think because AFICTA has begun, if you use a commercial vehicle to push a change, I see traction would be made rather than using policy, the Malabo Convention, fantastic idea, good on book, but because there is no commercial to it, there is no interest of the Africans, the layman on the street does not understand how Malabo affects him or her. It is actually limiting the pressure on governments to actually send on to it. So I believe that Africa will be better um, you know, pay our digital agenda, data security and data protection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Femi. This is the wonderful thing about having such a diverse group um, and also um, having the presence of Esther um, and having just listened to, you know, Yemi being very passionate about the Malabo Convention um, you know, Esther talking about her concerns about the approach being adopted in, you know, Tanzania and, you know, um, people being silenced, you know, rather than, you know, the focus being on protection. And then also hearing from you about, um, you know, Afita and the harmonization project. Um, you know, that is a massive development, um, in my opinion. Um, I would love, love, love to um, bring some attention to uh, Mr. Olumide just to hear from your perspective, um, you know, in the last 12 months, and given the input that we've had already from the other panelists, um, you know, what has shifted for you? All right, um, good morning, everyone. Um, let me, I'll try to put everything in context and then go ahead to express one or two opinion. So the context right now is that um, we have the Malabo Convention, just passed in 2014. And then we have several other sub-regional um, documents that would pass between 2011 and 2014. And um, the question that came to my mind is that um, how come um, eight years after the um, passing of the um, Malabo Convention, we have less than five ratify, um, ratifying countries, considering the fact that the provision of the Malabo Convention actually says that you need 15 ratifying countries before it can come into effect. And um, when you look at that, um, what you will probably say then is that, look, <laughs> it is, the either lack of awareness is not a priority issue for African governments. But you then need to then put that context and put that against the context, again, the fact that the context of the fact that out of 54 countries, between 27 to 29 countries have one form of uh, data protection regulation or the other. And um, they are in various stages of enforcement, but at least effort has been made to have some form of regulation. 
and therefore it is not as bad as it looks when you consider the level of ratification of the Malabo Convention. Um, but so, but so, so the issue is, but what we then need to understand is the fact that circumstances over the past eight years, or let's say over the past um, six to seven years, is signif are significantly different from what we have faced since 2020, when um, COVID more or less catalyzed the um, digital um, revolution that we have been speaking about. And we've been looking at it, we've been talking about it in future tense, and then COVID turned it into present and past tense for us. And then also the coming into effect of the Africa Free Trade um, Area Agreement. I think those two um, events will push um, data protection and harmonization of data protection framework to the fore. However, we still need to fight to consider whether we have the right people in government or whether government itself understand what it needs to do, understand what it stands to gain in order to make it top priority. I was reading um, the reason for the free trade, Africa free trade um, um, area agreement. And one of the issues that were raised were the were barriers, both tariff and non-tariff barriers. And the issue will be that do African governments understand that um, if we don't have a harmonized data protection framework, it will constitute a non-tariff barrier to free trade. So that if they understand that, look, that is one of the barriers that we need to crack, or that's one of the barriers that the free trade agreement was designed to crack, then it needs to then find a way to fast track the organization process. Another thought that came to my mind, which um, may not be very relevant, is that I asked myself that, okay, GD the EU GDPR came into effect in 2018 and it, it just caused a stir, caused commotion all over the place. Then how come that could happen? And it's not the case in Africa. Some people have said that it's because of the level of the awareness. But the fact is also that there's also a legislative structure process that made the GDPR instantly effective across all the EU countries, which is lacking or absent in Africa. And as a result, um, we are left to the, um, how will I put it now, to the, to how each government or each state sees um, data protection. So ultimately, and I commend the AU, I commend Femi and his team for what they are doing. But ultimately, we, need, we have to understand that um, each country is a sovereign by itself. And because it's a sovereign, you can't force a country to do what it does not want to do. It can only do what it wants to do or what is considered to be in its interest. And so at the end of the day, Chances are that the harmonization framework that AU is currently championing will suffer the same fate as the Malabo Convention in that we will get together a fantastic document, but the individual governments will still not see the reason why it should be a front burner and that it should be harmonized or, or adopted into the municipal laws of each country. And that may be where the issue of awareness they need to come up. A lot of engagement, a lot of education needs to go on, particularly with respect to, um, with regard to the legislative process. The people in the legislative process need to be educated on the importance of cybersecurity. And so it's even easier to argue 
the issue of cybersecurity. They are with the with all the different hacking and all the, at the ransomware and everything. It's right. The camel's nose is right inside the net, and they have to do something. Data protection still looks a little bit esoteric to them, and they are the ones that we need to carry along because ultimately they are the ones that will then need to we need to amend the structure that we agree on. We have um, um, after we are after the NDPR in Nigeria after the NDPR the executive. Um, bill on data protection act has been introduced and since the time it was published there has been very little um, news about its progress about anything on it out there that is part of the issue we speak about budgets the law of other things so as far as the typical African is concerned, both government and a lot of things that are more important to us than data protection. And if you do an X-ray of our news items, week in, week out, you will see those things and you will see that hardly do you hear data protection among them. That needs to change one way or the other so that harmonization will not be another attempt at a white elephant project at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking so passionately. Um, you know, we have a specific talking point and you've actually led, um, you know, very, very nicely into that topic. Um, before I actually um, state what that question is, two things. One is, um, I know, Esther, you've had your hand up and I think you've been keen to comment um, and before um, I ask you to speak um, we still have Taufik um, so Taufik uh, I haven't forgotten about you you've spoken very very passionately um, in the short time that you and I have met so I'm looking forward to hearing from you um, I definitely want to try and keep the flow so you know I'd like to um, give um, Esther the opportunity to um, make a comment um, and just prior to that two things I want to highlight um, that Lumide um, noted. One is, I'm so glad that you brought up the subject of um, EU GDPR. Um, the fact that we were looking at 30 countries, um, you know, from, you know, memory, you know, my own little bits of research, it took approximately four years of negotiations um, across 30 countries. You know, that in my mind already is a red flag. You know, what is it going to take um, you know, for a unified, um, you know, framework to be implemented across 45 countries that are even more diverse, um, I believe, culturally um, and in terms of, you know, development than the countries within the EU. And then also highlighting the fact that, you know, um, it is not evident that data protection is even a priority. Um, you know, so points that I, I want sort of, you know, all of panelists to please um, keep in mind. But, um, you know, before we move on to Taufik, um, Esther, um, please, I'd like to invite you to make your comments. Thank you. And I would really like to add uh, to what Mr. Olumide said um, about, is it a priority really? Like uh, we're speaking about um, data protection framework and to my is ready, like, ready like yesterday. But the government sector still doesn't think it's a priority. I'll give you an example. So I had a chat a month ago with one of our ministers, and I was saying, what's the issue? Now COVID has accelerated things. Now we are moving to the right direction. Now we know what to, how to use um, um, work um, from home, things that were not there. And if we would advise there, I think, no, Africans want to be lazy. You can't, how can you work from home? He asked our, our minister, that, what, what, what is it? Then he gave me an example that um, it's, it's a bit, but I'm going to explain it to you. He asked me, Esther, if you are given a handkerchief, that's 
That's unfortunately you're glitching. So I'm gonna have to ask you to start your story again. We're all very engaged. Somebody into hello. We're missing bits of it though. So ask, you can just start oh, the story okay. again. It's glitching oh. a little bit. Ah, uh, okay. I was saying, um, the minister told me, you can hear me now. Yeah. So if you're given a handkerchief, a piece of a handkerchief, and you're naked, which part of your body will you cover? <laughs> a basic question, like, okay, I have a budget here, but my budget is very minimal. And the needs are like, so I have to be very sure but is it a need or a want? Like, if you speak about internet, if you speak about data security, data protection, is it a need or a want? Because there are people in the villages who don't have water. There are some places where they don't have electricity. And there are some places that don't have hospitals in some uh, other villages. So you're here t telling me about data protection framework. Is it a need? Do I need it right now? Or I just want it? So that shows us that the mindsets that our government have and the mindsets that the private sectors have, you know, private sectors will be ready. Like, okay, we need to do this. This has to happen. We need to be global and we have to move together as a nation and as a continent. But the government uh, sector, they're like, no, I don't think so because we have other urgent issues. So as, uh, as Mr. Alumide said, it's more of a priority issue. So I don't know what we could discuss, but what has to be done to convince the government to be on board and know that we need to progress. And this is, 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 is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. So Taufik. Thank you. Um, very to thank hear. you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's a privilege to be amongst these um, giants in the room. Thank you very much, uh, Roke, for the good job you're doing. And I would like to especially recognize uh, Tax Tech for uh, putting this together and uh, needs that for that um, institutional support, which is very, very critical uh, to achieving the change that we want in, uh, in Africa. And um, my fellow panelists, uh, Femi Oyemi, Olumide, Esther, thank you very much for, for the wonderful background that you guys have laid um, on um, the issue of a uniform framework for personal security, uh, data security. Um, I, I like to, to say that Africa is very unique and um, whatever happens in every part of the world, uh, we, we make the mistakes of not looking at Africa as a very unique continent and uh, to domesticate um, and Africanize what, uh, what we're bringing to Africa. Uh, AU GDPR, um, it's, um, it's easier to, uh, to enforce in EU because of some level of development across EU. For example, you can't, you can't be a ghost in the US, right? Um, without a social security number, you can't do anything in the US, for example. Um, I would like to say that everybody in this room is, 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 is a ghost, okay? Um, you can do something here in Africa and take your data to Tanzania where, uh, uh, where my friend uh, Esther is sitting and uh, nothing happens, okay? So, but I would like to say that, um, you know, changes in Africa uh, has never been led by government. It has been private sector driven and with, uh, with help of, you know, regulators like um, what um, needs that at the good work that NIDA has been doing, like this conversation that we're having. You know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, platform where uh, um, people have to the awareness. You know, looking at the looking critically at the um, the the uh, the recommendations from from the last year's conclave. You know, awareness came first, right? And this is where the individuals play a very big, huge role. Okay, so when we talk about data, we should talk about a three tripod of data, which is, um, you know, uh, privacy, security, and protection. Okay, at the end of privacy, it's where the, you know, we can enforce the human rights of saying, what should I even share? What am I supposed to share? How do I protect 
sorry, um, what is what kind of um, information do I need to share as an information, right? I go to the gym every day and I'm having to fill my name every day. I'm having to fill my phone number, some I ignore. And, you know, we've had to have this kind of international conferences where you put in for international audience and you put in the uh, the clause or um, um, what's it called now? Um, a place for phone numbers and, you know, anything that is personal, you don't get attendance because they are not inclined to share those information, okay? I mean, in Africa, you see that your phone number is tied to your accounts, it's tied to your BVN, for example, in Nigeria, it's tied to everything. But again, you are the gate of any, any institution and you are having to write that phone number here and there. Okay, so privacy first, which is from the individual perspective. And the, at the enterprise level, when we now start to talk about secu um, security, data security and data protection, uh, where you have the threats, and uh, the integrity of data. So we have a whole lot of work to do with awareness, okay? And private sector needs to drive this conversation. For example, you look at a company like NCN that has data of you know, billions of people in Africa. And if there is no um, regulation like um, you know, uh, NDPR in Nigeria, which neither is going to a, go a good job, this, uh, people will still be sharing that information. I sit down here, I get notification from somebody that is holding um, a lending platform, um, you know, uh, money, and because he has defaulted, his, his information is shared across his contact list. You know, this, how do we ensure enforcement? Now, NDPR is here, but how do we ensure enforcement across Africa? And for Africa to have a unified framework. Again, we need to start talking about the individual countries. Um, Esther has given a good background as to what is happening in, um, in our country, for example. How do we ensure that um, the minimum standard, for example, you have um, the OECD countries, uh, recently um, the Federal Inland Revenue, uh, which, uh, which we did a lot of job with, wants to share taxpayers' information uh, with OECDs, okay? But that will never happen unless they, they get a certification for ISO 2701, okay? Which is part of the things that NIDA is promoting. They wouldn't share information with FRS, but now that they've gotten um, certified, they have tax, um, you know, uh, information for Nigerians, you know, across this over 100, um, 100 um, tax partner countries that can seamlessly share information because of what? Because of perceived integrity of data. There, there's a lot to be done. And I think it is, first of all, would be private individual and private sector driven. Then when the and private as informed can start doing the advocacy, at individual states level, then we now take it to the you know um, you know to the continental level where we still have a lot of depth of infrastructure around um, you know data security and whatnot. I, I think um, these are just my uh, my thoughts you know uh, from what um, uh, the the part of the foundation that they have laid uh, so far. Thank you so much, Alfie. Wonderful to hear from you. Um, as I mentioned just before you spoke, uh, I feel that, you know, we have, you know, automatically just naturally um, dive straight into what challenges um, are we likely to face with implementing a uniform security framework. So we asked that question as in what other challenges, because I think that we, we did a number of them. You know, I'm not sure that we covered all, and I'm sure that you know, Steve from this one, you, you, you probably are going to be the next person to speak on this particular um, point. Um, so, do I hand okay, over to you? Thank you, uh, Ronke. Um, I mean, why I say this is uh, I would latch on to uh, comments from Esther and uh, Olumide, but before that, I recall that uh, during the uh, keynote address, uh, the keynote speaker mentioned something that was um, uh, 
um, quite interesting to me, and it was the issue of sanctions, right? And uh, when I had sanctions, uh, what came to me is, should that be the right step, at least at this point? I don't know. I mean, and it's good that uh, a, a, a representative of the, or someone who works with the supervisory authority is here, and it would be good to hear uh, his thoughts. But um, for me, let us take a good example of a country, I, I particularly would not mention the name of the country, but we know that uh, recently there was a coup in an African country uh, that led to the first full takeover of government. And as Esther has said, if you have an anchor chief and you're naked, what would you cover? That kind of country, uh, let's, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if there's any form of uh, uh, data protection regulation in that country, but let's assume that uh, we are having conversations with that type of country with regards to having a uniform data protection framework, then the question would be that is that the right conversation to have with that country at that time that is perhaps battling for political stability hmm. uh, as opposed to uh, a situation where the country is fairly stable. Uh, I would assume that that type of country will be battling with internal political issues to ensure that there's stability, economic issues, and perhaps even pressure from the international community uh, to transition into a democratically elected government. And if we put that side by side with, uh, um, with the need to comply with either cyber security and data protection, then the question is perhaps a country like that will say that is not a need at this time. Now, um, what will now be the role of sanctions um, in order to engender uh, compliance? Uh, particularly, maybe I'm a bit hesitant, I am a bit hesitant uh, to go the sanction route, or maybe I'm looking at sanction from uh, the heavy, and I mean, an heavy hammer perspective, perhaps, uh, I mean, how I would look at it will be from what um, uh, Ulumide mentioned to say that uh, these countries need to recognize that um, not having sufficient uh, data protection framework in place or cybersecurity framework in place Right, is uh, will constitute a trade barrier. Uh, looking at uh, the uh, after perspective, and um, they need to understand as such what they stand to lose in terms of trade, in terms of uh, growing their GDP, and perhaps in terms of uh, per capita income of uh, the citizenry. I think that may be uh, a better way to engender uniformity as opposed to we just uh, are blotting out or handing out uh, uh, sanctions, we may, which may be counterproductive. But uh, I, I think going the route of uh, showing uh, these uh, states that uh, you stand to lose more than, uh, I mean, you stand to lose more comparative to in this uh, to a situation whereby you take no action at all. So those are my thoughts for now. Sorry, oh, Emily, thank you. Um, oh, I've got two raised hands, uh, one physical one, um, Femi and Taufik. I think you've got a comment. If I ask you, Taufik, please to... I think uh, Femi should go first. Okay. <laughs> Your hand was up first, so um, I'm sorry I... So let me allow you go first. Sir. Okay, I, I'm still. I, I'm going to latch on um, the, the comment of um, OEME of uh, you know about tying um, you know data protection security to trade. Um, trade uh, commerce drives everything, and um, if we um, if for uh, for any reason, just like uh, Esther said. Um, you have an anchor chief and you're naked, what would you cover? Okay, uh, for trade is the window to every organ, uh, to every, uh, um, whether continent or um, um, states. 
Okay, uh, if there are guidelines, um, and there are erudite lawyers here who have done a lot of work around, uh, um, you know, data protection laws, but if for with after we, we have strict continental guideline um, to state the minimum requirements of data protection and security that is required for any, um, any country that is willing to do intra-African trade uh, to have in terms of how they manage their, uh, their, their secure data and uh, protect data. I think it will go a long way uh, you know, to ensure uh, the uh, you know pan African you know framework. I think at trade level, it's easier to um, to start this conversation and drive it to legislative uh, uh, you know uh, level. Again, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so um, I I'll leave that uh, that knowledge uh, that knowledge area to to the gentlemen here in the room. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think that's a really strong argument as well. Um, so, you know, thank you for highlighting that. Um, Femi, you'd like to make a comment? Yeah, so I, well, I, you know, Yemi was my senior in school, so I don't like debating him, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but um, okay, I, so the lawyers are here now. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like debating him, and I hope it's still within the rules for us to banter once in a while. But I wanted to say that and also addressing Illumidi's point, whether, and also Esther's point, is this, um, the, is this now a need? Number one, I agree that it is, we need to do a lot to educate our policymakers. And we've also, we need to also take some blame as citizens of Africa because we have abdicated our responsibility of governance and left it to only the elected officials. So by not investing in development and orienting our leaders, we are falling behind in so many things that are actually happening. I would say that would harmonization work now compared to Malabo Convention, the efforts that have been made before? Why do we think that harmonization would work now? And if it's going to work, what approach do I, do I think would work? It would work now because number one, international aid is drying up. China, who was the latest, largest sharer, is going on that tremendous economic and other social political now that the government in Africa were actually banking on to continue, you know, supporting the, 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 uh, in the, 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 how do I, I don't want to use something, a word that would make them, you know, think of reducing my salary at the end of the month. But the, the way we've, we've not, we've not played at the topmost level in terms of governance. So now with the reality of the fact that the foreign aid is reducing and it's almost virtually gone, we now need, we are, people are beginning to think. And if you really, if you listen to some of the speeches that were given by some of the leaders of the continent at the UN Council, I mean, the UN meeting, you listen to the presidents of Ghana and probably Rwanda, you understand that Africa is coming to a realization of the fact that these things cannot continue as they've always been. Now, if that is that, so that pressure is there that you either shape one up or you'll be shipped out or you'll be left out of the of the of the of the of the of the play another thing that's going to influence and pressure us to begin to comply is that even the multinationals who are looking for the africa middle east and africa has the largest growth potential for many of the multinationals facebook the googles and all that because some of their countries are already saturated so they are looking for growth now to be dealing with 54 countries. So if there is any way in which you can actually influence the continent to band together as a multinational that has a very humongous budget, you would rather invest in that so that that harmonization at some level, because look at the harmonization in Europe is different from that of Asia for data protection, for example. Asia has just um, the CBP rules, you know, and 
you just need to sign up to it as a multinational and then you can say that across asia you are already i mean i'm talking of the 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 tiger the asian tiger nations you are already complying so you don't need to go from country to country trying to understand and trying to you know have a kind of um you know um compliance at different levels so that pressure would also force us now to actually begin to act another thing that is going to force the the common you know the integration is the economic integration pressure the the, the fact is now that what Nigeria is going through, a lot, of course, if you look at our, 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 the, the value of the currency, people are not happy, prices are going up. But I wonder, the same thing, you go to US, people are crying that prices are going up, food, gas, and all that is going up. And people here think it's worry, but people also think it's um, Biden. And you are wondering whether it's the B word that is causing the increase. But it's not about the B word. It's just the fact that globally, there is economy, uh, there is, um, you know, value chain issues, China is having challenges, you know, the production lines are changing, and a lot of things are changing. So that is also going to pressure countries in Africa to begin to look at how do we begin to think inwardly, and if we're going to relate with others, what do we need to do? Then also citizen pressure. One of the things that are driven the modest achievements we've had about data protection in Nigeria is not because government is necessarily resourced in terms of intellectual capacity or financial capacity to do data protection. What is actually driving data protection in Nigeria is the citizen pressure on a daily basis as a desk officer or um, you know, whatever you, you, you wish to call it. I receive mails on a daily basis oh, I have received a mail from um, a, a SMS, just like Mr. Taufik mentioned, you know, that someone will say I, the, some my information. And the truth of the matter is that it's not just at the base level, even ministers, even presidents, even, I mean, governors are receiving messages and people are just yesterday, one of the things we're dealing with was that a top level banker had, he had a problem with his wife. And he got someone to hack into a high cloud account, collected seven years of record of our social media and personal information, and had videos of her, you know, having he alleged, you know, he alleged that the wife was actually, you know, um, interacting with another man in an, you know, in, in an uncomfortable way. And he was threatening to actually bring that up. So these are bringing pressure on us. And to be, I mean, to bring, because some of these things, sometimes we speak about it in such a very high bulletin uh, manner. My wife is also receiving SMS and people are telling her that somebody has collected loan and that she's the guarantor. And she's telling me at home that you, you call yourself data protection regulator. What are you going to do about this? And that has become a family, a family trouble. My children are beginning to say, oh, you can't, you know, and it's, I need to do something about it, you know. So the these pressures are actually, you know, things that are going to drive us to actually take action in terms of the of, of, of data protection. But my the que next question, the approach would now be, and, and to Esther's point, indeed, there is, if you look at Norway, the amount of um, the amount of money spent on a citizen in Norway compared to Nigeria. Norway is about $33,000 for a citizen. Nigeria is about $200. So if you have an handkerchief indeed, what are you going to do? Are you going to cover your face, cover your chest, cover any other part? So what have we done in Nigeria? We have one of the least budgets in, in, in Nigeria for data protection. Every year it's, um, it's being caught, yet the impact is rising. So. While there is the issue of financial resourcing, but the greater issue that Africa has is intellectual and moral resources. How many people are willing to do something to make a difference and they are willing to you know, pay a sacrifice to actually get those things done? That is what we need in governance. So the approach for me would be, it would be that the approach would be, would be that number one, we should not approach data protection as it's been approached in Europe because Europe has a hundred years you know, history on data protection. America even has a longer history than Europe. So what I think we need to do is to have a confederated, a confederated approach. Let's have a framework, a loose binding, a loosely you know, crafted document that people can sign up to. 
if Tanzania says we are not going to comply with this basic minimum, then the, the data flow ecosystem, you'll be excluded from it. If Nigeria is not willing to comply with this, then you are going to be, of course, we'll continue to be brothers, we continue to be friends, but you cannot, data flow into your country will be restricted. And then the opportunities that others have, if you get 15, 20 countries that, that have this kind of bounded you know, approach, I'm telling you that many of the other countries are going to begin to, you know, to, to get into it. So I think I'll leave it at that at this point. Thank you. Let me thank you for speaking so passionately. Um, you, what I've loved about this, um, I mentioned this to the panel, is that I wanted the discussion to be fluid um, and I didn't want us to, you know, be sort of focused on very specific questions. I feel that we have been able to address some of the topics um, that I wanted to come out. Um, one being, how will a unified data protection framework impact the continent? This is exactly where you've um, beautifully, you know, led us into. I'm now actually very conscious of time. This is a very big topic and I'm not convinced that we're going to be able to cover absolutely everything. We're really, really fortunate in having 56 attendees today. And um, we'd like to open up the floor to invite a few questions. We want the session to be interactive. Um, I think that, you know, we've had a really, really good discussion up until now. Um, you know, this dialogue will continue to go on, but, um, you know, I'd like to open up the floor for questions um, at this stage. So my panel, um, I hope that you're comfortable with that. Yes. Okay. So ask um, to help us with that. Attendees actually going to be writing in or typing? Okay, at the moment, I don't see anything in the Q&A and I don't, you know, whilst I have this, you know, fantastic panel um, together, I'm going to actually um, suggest that, you know, we continue our discussion. Um, you know, the audience know that they can write in, um, we'll give them a little bit of time um, to do that. But um, should we pick up where we left off uh, just for a moment? Um, so Femi, as I said just now, you brought us really nicely into, you know, how um, a unified framework can actually impact um, the continent. Um, Lumide, you're looking very relaxed. <laughs> I'd love to hear your contribution to that. Any thoughts? You're on mute. Well, so um, I believe um, a lot has already been said about that um, and essentially um, we'll talk to um, digital business, particularly e-commerce, and um, uh, um, enhancing or increasing the flow of um, business and commerce between African countries. It's interesting to see that um, the number or the amount of business that goes out of Africa within Africa. And um, the way forward would be to actually find a way to improve that. People need to be able to move across, people need to be able to do business across Africa in whichever way. And um, like someone said, the key to that is uh, building trust. And if there's no trust, 
in your digital system. Um, you don't have um, the necessary framework to engender that trust then understanding. So for instance, one of the reasons why electoral process, um, it, we have very little, um, little participation across the board in electoral process or governance is that absence of trust. And so that is what will also happen to where you have an opaque or you have a porous uh, system where um, information can just be taken and be thrown around. And so the number one thing is, and then that trust will then build um, every other thing. And, um, and um, so, um, we, like um, Femi also said, um, at this point of our development, um, hu and the human rights angle will most likely need to take a back seat, or at least will be the back end. And um, in any case, when you read most of um, our data protection regulation, what you find is that one way or the other, the rights are still recognized. Because when you look at um, the um, when you look at classification of um, of data breaches, um, it talks about the impact on the rights of the individual. That's what would at time determine um, the level of uh, sanction or determine the level of uh, disclosure that has to be made either to the uh, to the data protection agency or any other agency that needs to be made. So that is already there. And the issue is for us to have a well-rounded um, approach that sees data protection as a necessary um, necessary uh, requirement for living in the 21st century global world. And to be sure, and, and see, one of the problems that we have in Africa right now is that while we live in the 21st century global world, or we say the global village, we tend to, when it comes to um, making policies and taking decisions, we then want to do a microcosm and say that, look, it is our people alone. And we need to understand that we now live, even as backward or as infrastructurally deficient as we may be, we still live in a global village where everything affects everybody and where there is free flow of information. And therefore, as we need to, as we take a, uh, um, that narrow view of what we, where we are, we need to always put that in the context of where our people will play. And um, no matter what we say, our people, so for instance, our people are on WhatsApp. Uh, so even dated, the unexposed uses WhatsApp, uses um, TikTok and several other um, um, software apps that are dependent on personal data. And um, when you then put that into context, it then means that whatever um, regulation and whatever policy you want to, want, to, you want to adopt should take that into consideration. That my people are for my laws, my regulations should be such as will enable them to effectively participate in that global space without suffering any deficiency or any 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 weakness and um regrettably we put ourselves in this position and we have to deal with it and we cannot run away from that problem it's a problem we need to face head on well we may have to devise an african approach to it but it's a problem the problem now is that the issues have assumed global perspective and we need to address it with global perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
um, I want to pick up on a point that you made, um, you know, which I just think is, you know, um, so strong, so right, so relevant. Um, it is indeed a pity that, um, you know, the conversation isn't being predominantly driven um, from a human rights um, perspective. Um, however, the conversation that we've had about sanctions, the sort of carrot stick approach, um, the conversation we're having about, you know, trade, um, you know, I think it's real and, and, you know, we have to be very realistic about, you know, how this, um, you know, unified framework can be moved forward. Um, you know, we talked about timing, stability, prioritization in different countries, funding, um, you know, so we just have to be very sort of grown up, I think, um, you know, and realistic about, you know, what it's going to take to, um, you know, raise the profile um, of the issue um, amongst, uh, you know, different countries. Um, so I think I think it's been a, you know, sort of really um, good um, and strong ideas being shared. So um, we have just, I think, a few minutes left, um, and I want to go back and give the audience an opportunity um, to ask this, um, you know, distinguished panel, so, so fortunate to have all of you here this morning, um, an opportunity to ask you questions. So if I just go back to the host for a moment. Um, I don't know whether it's just my view. Unfortunately, I'm not able to see questions. So assistance from my host, please. I don't want to do the audience yeah, listening. There, there is a question. Yeah. There is a question. question. Okay. Is it's in the chat? Is it okay. It's in the chat. No, I'm looking at Q and A. That's so I'm in the wrong place. Right. So here's the question. How do we strike a balance between data governance in terms of data and privacy protection vis-a-vis -vis open data advocacy? And I'm opening that up to any of our panelists. How do we strike a balance between data governance in terms of data and privacy protection vis-a-vis -vis open data advocacy. Maybe I can, I can start, but I would definitely be needing help of others. So my, <clears throat> the, the, the balance, there is, there is actually, um, that there is a conundrum that currently we are. The digital economy runs on data. The big tech organizations, the most successful organizations, they run on data. The more data you have as a country or as a company, and that you have the resources to mine them appropriately, you will be able to make more, get more economic value, security value, even national value out of those. But there's also the conversation about the rights of the individual to privacy. So the question has been, where do we strike the, the balance? I would say that practically it's an ongoing issue. The, and that also brings us back to the issue of even understanding the philosophies of data protection by the various jurisdictions. If you look at Europe's GDPR did not just come about because Europe was just interested in making a law. It came about as a pushback against America's dominance of the digital space, which the technology companies that are actually processing data, that are collecting data, they are more from America. So if you look at the case of uh, Schrems 1 and 2, it's all about the contention of you know, uh, what, um, how much data can you collect from me and how can you use those? So the, 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 the what data protection laws are, that's why we call it data protection, maybe acts or laws and all that. The reason why it's data protection is because there is already, the te technology has gone far ahead 
and data is already flowing everywhere, but just providing some basic guiding principles to reduce the exposure and to ensure that even if you are processing this data, you are processing it in line with the legal and legitimate framework. That's the whole idea of uh, you know, data protection. So while we are talking about data protection, we should also be careful as a country not to go too far to the right, to such a point that we're only talking about the right, the right to data privacy, and we now lose the opportunities of the data ecosystem, which is also very important for technology, you know, startups, and some other things that we're trying to do. So there needs to be, and we need a very agile thinking in government, government and even all of us, for us to be able to strike that balance, else we're going to lose out from the global economy and data economy. Thank you. Let me take a, 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 a pitch. and let me say that um, number one, um, at, and this argument has become very relevant in this age, and it has nothing to do with um, data protection and open um, data. It's about freedom. How free can you be? And what what people fail to understand is that freedom is actually guaranteed by rules and regulation. You are free within the ambit of the law. You are not free outside the law. You are not free to do anything that the law says you should not do. And so data governance has already addressed, when we say data governance, we're talking about the rules and regulations of what you are, can do and cannot do with data, personal or corporate or otherwise. So it then extends even to, um, to um, corporate, um, corporate or industrial espionage and every other thing. And so the issue remains that, um, you have open data as far as your data governance rules permit. The question would then be taken um, from what Femi has said, your philosophy for data protection. Why do you want to regulate data, access to data? And what use do you see that data can be, can be put to? And where you and within between that, your the issue of open data then become addressed. So if, like in America, you want to have almost or restricted access to data, that is right to be informed, that is a lot of other rights, then your open data rules or may be a lot permissive. But the issue remains that you, number one there must be access to data for everybody to do whatever they want to do. Two is that your access to data must be regulated so that the exercise of your rights does not impact negatively on the rights of the other people, either privacy or every other right. And so the balance will have to be between that where people must have access to data to do everything, legit every legitimate thing that they want to do. However, the use of such legitimately acquired data must be responsible so that it does not infringe the rights of the other people. That is my, that's the balance as far as I'm concerned. But like I said, I'm speaking in a very simplistic manner. Okay, I, I mean, I have a bit of intervention as well. And um, I say this on the back of a recent experience, uh, which we are currently uh, doing some work for um, a state government in Nigeria. And um, we're doing some work around data protection uh, compliance. And um, the issue of open data, uh, ability to have access to data vis-a-vis -vis what uh, issues around data governance came to fall. And um, one of the government officials, quite senior, I must say, was quite uh, agitated at the time we finished uh, the session with them. And he says, gentlemen, I hear you. I must process personal data in accordance with the NDPR, but do not forget that I have an obligation under the Freedom of Inco Information Act, right, to provide information to members of the public. Where do I stand? And you could see the agitation because apparently is faced with issues whereby 
persons come, I mean, and it's the government agency, persons come under uh, the auspice of the Freedom of Information Act to say that you, you must provide information obligation on all this without necessarily infringing the provisions of the NDPR. And uh, as Femi has said, is there is a delicate balance, is an ongoing conversation. Uh, I would advise is also um, to the extent that you are under an obligation, under a subsisting act, Provide that you use mind, civil manner, so uh, uh, privacy is not uh, compromised. But the question is also you may be faced with a situation where uh, some of inform I mean, the information which is being requested for uh, actually border on uh, personal data. Uh, but navigating the murky waters of uh, the delicate balance between uh, ensuring that that information is also provided in a responsible manner is um, it's an ongoing conversation. And my advice is always, in the event that uh, you think there is a likelihood that you would breach personal data when you are complying with provisions of the Freedom of Information Act, then perhaps um, you may be you may be found under a situation whereby one, you need to look at, uh, maybe I'm now speaking legally now, uh, one, the issue would be, which is superior in terms of legislation. I don't want to go into that argument because I know Lumi Day is always passionate about that argument, but um, essentially it's an ongoing conversation in terms of maintaining the balance between open data advocacy and uh, data governance as, as it is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayemi. Uh, we have another question coming from Lawrence Ohineme, um, which is in our Q&A box. Lawrence says, many thanks to the panelists for the interesting perspectives they have brought to the discussion. In view of the failure of African countries to sign up to the Malabo Convention, to make it come into effect eight years after the adoption, do the panelists see African countries agreeing to a continent-wide framework that will come into, the, into force soon to address these data protection security issues? So I, I think we've touched on this point at various stages. Um, does anybody wanna take that? Esther? Yes, so um, um, I would like to say that I, I, I can't see countries agreeing. I can't see Africa one day coming into consensus and we're all speaking one language. But one, I, I feel like one thing has to change. And the thing that has to change, I think, is the language that we communicate data protection to the stakeholders. So we need to communicate to a way that they understand. Let's say if I'm a cybersecurity specialist and I come to you talking to you about um, threats, um, like ransomware, I'm just telling you difficult, difficult languages, you end up looking at me confused. But if I come and tell you the impact it has on the business, the impact it has on your life, then it will start making sense and feel like it's something that you need to comply or abide to. So I think we need to change the language to which we communicate to different stakeholders. We create a language that they understand. Let's say we had a scenario of four or five years back whereby um, a government official in Kenya was hospitalized and was allergic to sulfur. And that information was only in his medical records, only there, nowhere else. So apparently someone got access to the data and rubbed the sulfur parts. So the doctor didn't uh, review the file, was like, ah, this guy's okay. So gave the patient suffer, and that patient didn't make it. So then again, 
when you communicate to the health practitioners that okay we need security we need data protection they won't understand you but when you tell them the impact of it to their level that they can understand i think they will all come to terms just like when you're speaking to a baby sometimes you have to change certain tones or certain um words to fit their understanding so uh, to, to summarize it what i'm saying is let's just communicate to the level that anyone everybody can understand let's change the way we communicate to the stakeholders stakeholder management i like that thank you esther Okay, we have a few more questions that are coming in. Here's another one for FinTech. How do we balance data privacy and bottom line considering high volume of non-performing loans? I think uh, I think Femi will be in a good position to answer that, bearing in mind that uh, uh, the the supervisory authority has been levying tax on along those lines. So maybe it would be good to hear his perspective. And perhaps Femi, when you are considering this question, I think one thing I want you to also perhaps consider, and not necessarily give us a, a response, is also um looking at this from a business perspective um interestingly uh i mean i think it's public knowledge now uh at least uh, based on uh, what we see on the internet in terms of that need does a uh, uh, penalty on um so-called loans uh but you know interestingly i had a conversation with a business owner that uh that is um in the micro lending space and there was an interesting view. The interesting view was that, uh, okay, how much is the penalty which I'm so, supposed to be subject to? Uh, what would be the, and I guess he's looking at this strictly from a business perspective, what is my exposure is X amount. When I put that side by side, uh, what I, I, I stand to gain in terms of loan recovery, then I may be better off paying my penalty and ensuring that I get my my loans recovered. So it would be good to hear your perspective on this, Femi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Femi. Um, and it's a very, it's a very, um, in fact, we are actually in the middle of a, 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 an endemic or a pandemic in terms of the digital loans um, providers. Uh, I would, I would have loved to actually pay, I give more attention to the to the question, but I think answering this will help us to be able to to put into perspective the question raised by the by the uh, person in the audience now currently what what happened about the shoko loan <clears throat> and which is currently still happening with some other providers is that you have you know uh, lenders people go to a state because there is a lending law in Lagos state <laughs> All right. So in La so in Lagos State, you get the lending license to be able to provide loans, and you can lend because that is that is the law. But you know, but you don't have that right, legal right, to provide that same service outside of Lagos State without the license of other states. That's even the that's the first question, but that does not fall within Nita's remit. But the issue that has been arising now is that you have these people, lenders, you have an app, you tell someone to download the app on the phone, and the phone has access to the contact information, my contact, my contact app, you have direct access to that. Now, one of the things I'll need to tell, I would like to tell FinTech is that while building your product, ensure that you take, pay attention to the issue of privacy. The, the young man, the person I was discussing with Yemi is, I mean, um, with utmost and due respect, that person does not have foresight about business because the biggest collateral you have in business is trust. 
And when things begin to happen that people are losing trust in your platform, sooner than later, you would go under. Now, the, what has been, the point of our real contention is not the fact that I, I take, go to a platform and I take a loan, or I won't agree to you having contact, my contact. The point of the matter is that the people you are sending that message to do not have any consensual or contractual relationship with you. So in that instant, you do not have a right to send them an information that somebody has defaulted on a particular loan. So if what has what we have done, of course, for Shoko loan, we, we've investigated and we've come to a conclusion and they are not contesting it. But just like you said, people are looking at it that, what, how does this affect my balance sheet? Uh, the truth of the matter is that if we wanted to be as vicious as necessary, we can continue issuing a fine on the same entity on a daily basis. And if you multiply these, you understand that people are, it's now going to become, you know, it's going to become excessive. So what we have decided to do, and we have made this proposition to the management, is that let's even have a, a kind of a town hall event where the owners, the, the platform owners can come together and people who have been, you know, who have felt aggrieved can come together, let them have this conversation as regulators, let's talk to them. Then DPCOs can also say one or two things because research has gone on on this and it's not good at all. But there are ways in which this can still be done in a privacy preserving manner that will still bring value because our intent is not to stop lending operation, but to ensure that we do it in a way that does not affect them, you know, the rights of others. So thank you for, for that opportunity. So, uh, can I quickly jump in uh, and ride on the course of uh, Yes, please. So, Femi, uh, while you were talking, um, I, I picked a point, which is, uh, it's just a question, right, um, from me. How do we enforce the rights, the privacy rights of, uh, of individuals, uh, which has been breached? And what is, what's, how do we ensure that there, there are proper penalties? you know, for those breaches. And um, it's, um, we've talked about Sokolon, even after Sokolon, you've seen these breaches happen almost every day. And it hasn't stopped, okay? And this is privacy that are being breached on a daily. So how do we enforce, uh, you know, not that there are no laws out there, how do we ensure enforcement and put into consideration that these things are happening, you know, on the cyberspace? Okay, so the, there is no, there is no, uh, clear cut direct answer and i think all over the world people are still walking into the answer as a matter of fact even for i i, I don't like saying what I, I answering question what about this other person but i think it's good for us to put some of these things in context let's take for example the gdpr which everybody agrees is the strongest most robust instrument on data protection or you look at just the advertising technology sector alone, the volume of data breaches happening on a daily basis through ad, ad tech is humongous. And Facebook made $65, $62 billion on this ad tech in 2019. Google made $107 billion. And the figures are rising through advertising technology. What does that imply? People, by just seeing all my digital details, the footprint and all that, people, you, you advertise my, those details to supply side you know, partners, demand side partners, which are in hundreds and thousands. And they take that data that family has been to this website, he has been to this website, he has asked about the drug or he has asked about cigarettes or he has asked about this and asked about that. And they have that information, then they now use that information to target adverts to me. That is still an ongoing breach as we speak now. And it's almost impossible. Nobody, there, there's no answer to that currently. But what do we need to do from our own um, view? We need to be careful not to give too much power to government to say that for everything you see, shut down. I don't think government has that mandate, but what we can do is at least do exemplary punitive sanctions, work on information and awareness, 
and then begin to gradually help people to move to the level they need to be. Uh, we've done it with True Color. True Color came, they brought out a privacy policy. Nigeria was the only country in Africa that called out True Color. And when we made, because we knew, okay, imposing a fine was not the best option. How much are we going to impose on True Color? Worst case, let's impose 50 million or 100 million. It's paltry sum to them. But at the time we made an advertorial and said, this is what True Color is doing. You have a choice, make a decision. From seven million, the uh, monthly active users came to about three uh, to about four million. That three million that went into the doldrum was huge weight on their on their finances. So we need to government needs to be and, and it's not just about government, but all of us. And that's why being in this conclave, I'm not the only one here from NIDA. There are other of my colleagues that are also listening in. We are these are opportunities for us to learn, for us to see what is what can work. We need there is there is a sandboxing in regulation. We need to be able to try out different things and see what would work. Government doesn't have all the answers, but so long as we continue interacting like this, I'm sure we can find a middle ground to be able to do some of these things effectively. So the answer is, Mr. Taufik, the answer is not in my pocket, but um, I think we'll continue working working it out. Thank you. I'm going to throw some um, just additional information uh, into this because you're talking about, you know, what, um, you know, could be done. We have lessons to be learned from, you know, what's happening in Europe. Um, EU GDPR has been in place for uh, a little over three years now. And in actual fact, um, you know, I happen to know this information for a different session I was um, presenting in. Um, there have been some really hefty fines um, you know, that have been um, and, you know, Google, uh, you know, fined 50 million euros. Um, I can talk more specifically about H&M, the retailer, uh, who's fined 55.3 million euros. Um, this was in relation to some um, breaches um, in their, uh, you know, use of um, data relating to uh, human resources and basically uh, videoing employees without their permission. Uh, Telecom Italia were fined 27.8 million. Uh, British Airways, uh, due to uh, accidental, um, you know, breach of their loyalty database, um, had a very, very significant fine reduced down to 20 million um, pounds. Um, and that was because the regulator were being sympathetic um, towards the airline in view of the losses they were sustaining um, due to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, there, there have been some very significant um, sanctions that have been delivered uh, in that context. So, uh, and none from Africa, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love three from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, this is getting very interesting, right? I picked up something from Olimide uh, while he was talking, right? And the question is, um, are Africans, you know, beneficiary of their own data? You know, are we in any way? Uh, because some of this big organization, apart from the fintechs here, uh, they are using and mining the data of Africans. This data are not even stored here, okay? And um, the use and the, 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 the beneficiaries, okay, are not even Africans. So, and he said something that was quite, um, you know, sussing. You know, we cast this for ourselves because we don't even have any local alternative. So all, all the technologies or the platforms that we're, we're being consumed. Say, for example, Eroko TV, for example, was doing what Netflix, you know, um, um, is doing right now, okay? But we got to a stage where we as Africans believe more in, you know, the foreign, you know, the international brand. And um, what has happened? Now, you know, Netflix has taken over that space and all the data of virtually you and I uh, are shipped away and we're not even beneficiary of that data, how it's used, how it's been processed. And when it's time to even sanction for, uh, for the misuse of that data, are we in 
in the position to even enforce anything around the misuse or the abuse of our data. You know, that is, that is something that we need to, you know, to think about because here we're thinking about how Africans, you know, can, uh, you know, the African, uh, you know, unified personal data protection. It's, I, I'm just throwing this out there, you know, and, and I know there are lots of legal minds here. I'm just a technologist, okay? Thank you so much. Um, I've just been given a time reminder. I believe we have just a few minutes left um, and not all of the questions uh, that have been pouring in now from uh, participants have been answered. Um, however, we do have the opportunity to um, type answers um, back to them. So, so as we don't um, disrupt the rest of uh, the session, I think that we are going to need to wrap up. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to invite my panelists, um, you know, in view of our, you know, really wide discussion, um, are there any closing comments that any of you would like to make? Um, let me go first, um, and um, let me say that, um, like I said before, um, Africa lives in a global village, and it's about time that we step up to the plate, and we have to deal with our issues and deal with the issues, realizing that we continue to live in the global space. And what um, the pandemic has done is to also accelerate the process by a few decades. And right now, we don't have the luxury of saying we have time. We don't have time anymore. Um, we, the best, it will appear that um, in order to drive the awareness with respect to data protection and data security, we need to make a lot of noise about trade e-trade e and e-commerce and the gains that African countries will make from um, e-commerce and ease of doing business, particularly the success of the Africa Continental Free Trade um, Agreement, area agreement. And so we need to get serious. Like um, Esther said, communication um, um, design, the, the, combination, the communication around this needs to be redesigned, needs to be rethought. We need to tell each other in the language that we understand so that it makes sense and not, and not we need to take it out from the private sector se place to the public sector because the people who will implement and enforce this framework we're talking about are not the companies Companies are merely the users. And so we need to educate the public sector, particularly the government agencies, particularly the legislators to understand that number one, um, we need um, to guarantee access to information, to data, and we need to ensure that data is used responsibly and that um, we need to do all this in a way that ensures that there is gain to the country as well as to the people. The time is now to have that uniform um, framework. Um, it does not have to be detailed, but at least it should provide the minimum standard for data protection governance or data governance across the continent. And so that's what we should be aiming at, minimum standard. It should not go beyond this. Already, if you extray the data protection regulations in the various countries, you will see the features of this minimum standard. It's just for us to get it together and have a document that everybody that can serve as guide to other people and to ensure that it is done. And when we have that, we need to be serious about enforcement. 
I don't know about other African country. The problem with my country is that we have plethora of laws, beautifully written laws, stupidly written laws, every other laws. We have from the whole spectrum, from upside, up, outright absurd to intelligent, but implementation and enforcement is always the problem. And so in, at least in that regard, I would like to commend NITDA for what they've been doing. And there's a lot to be done. Though, of course, I still have my argument about whether they are the ones that should be doing the work, but at least someone is doing the work and we should commend them that they step to the place to um, take the conflict. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now really under time pressure. We've gone a few minutes over. So as much as I would love to have had all of the panelists speak, um, I just want to, you know, leave us with, um, you know, one particular, you know, sort of closing thought, um, you know, from all the conversations that we've had here, discussions about, you know, funding, priorities, stability, the difference in developments of, you know, different countries, the number of countries within the continent. The one thing that it leaves me with is a thought that um, it is so critical that we are developing an African solution to an African problem. As much as we have to learn from everything that's happening sort of within Europe and within the US, um, you know, there's a little, you know, we've had beautiful stories, very real stories, um, some of them very amusing. Thank you very much, you know, Femi, for, you know, adding a little bit of humor um, to this, but it's, it's been very real. I'm just going to give one very quick example. I don't know if anyone's been watching the news, but, um, you know, within the UK for the first time in decades, and certainly in my memory, we've been experiencing disruptions in the supply of um, petrol. And, you know, people have not been able to move their cars. There have been queues. Um, we don't have, you know, drivers. It's not as, um, you know, extensive you know, in this country as it is in Nigeria. So in the Nigeria context for, you know, people that are fortunate enough, you know, you might think, okay, that's fine. The driver can go and queue or there's a way or there's, there's, there's an extended network. Um, you know, people have been really limited. And I think one of the things that shocked me is the fact that, um, you know, this led to a fantastic amount of chaos. And, you know, what came to my mind is that, you know, this is what, these are the challenges that we face on a regular basis. Look how quickly our structure, you know, starts to fall apart, you know, here, um, when we are faced with the, you know, challenges that, you know, in Africa, you know, are much more commonplace. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to look to countries that don't have a real understanding of, the pressures that are being faced, um, you know, within the continent. That's why I'm using that one as a particular example, because, um, you know, things really did disintegrate um, very, very quickly. Um, and I just felt that, you know, well, there you go. You know, things happen very differently when the infrastructure is there, when things, you know, other things are happening very smoothly. But, you know, needless to talk about, we're talking about prioritizing data protection. But the handkerchief example that Esther gave, I think, was absolutely fantastic. You know, what do you do? Um, when you have significant, you know, pressures, you know, elsewhere. So, um, you know, we've had so much food for thought and I think the conversation has been real. And I would just like to thank all of you for your presence. I would also like to thank Tax Tech um, for bringing this, you know, whole incredible show together. Um, and I would like to thank our keynote speaker, um, you know, Patricia, um, you know, even though she wasn't able to make it. Femi, thank you very much for delivering this. Um, Mr. Abiola Sani, thank you so much um, as well. And, you know, on that happy note, um, I'm going to close this session. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for moderating the session wonderfully well. I also want to say thank you to all of our panelists. We appreciate you. Thank you for the thought-provoking and engaging insights that has been shared. Um, we would all agree that this should be a continuous conversation. To know more about data protection, a quarterly report is released and the link would be in the chat box where our participants can read more. Okay, 
without much ado, we'll be going straight into the second panel session. We'll be talking about the enforcement of data protection measure in after member states, compliance levels, issues arising, and enforcement strategies. And on this panelist, we have Yemi Adeniro, Olumide Babalola, Senator Inheren, Oluleke Olatsunji, and this session will be moderated by Olubenga Shile. Olubenga Shile has coordinated the development and deployment of landmark automated solutions and facilitated external API integrations at various periods. He is also experienced in organizational information security management system, ISMS, setup and processes targeted at minimizing risk and impact of security breaches and ensuring business continuity. Olugenga is Associate Partner and Head Operations, Intelligence and Communications at Tax Aid Professional Services. He is also an Executive Director, Operations at Tax Aid Technologies Limited. Thank you. With a digital round of applause, let's welcome Olugenga Shile and the rest of the panelists as we go through the session. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Stella, and thank you very much um, for the last panel session, Ronke, and uh, very that fantastic panel. Um, so we'll be going right into this session. Can I confirm my audio is okay? Can you confirm you can hear me, please? Um, maybe a wave of a hand or something, just to be sure I'm audible. I can hear you from here. Hope you can hear me. Yes, hey, I can great, hear great. you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, uh, my panelists here already. Hi, Yemi, Ululeke, and Senator. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Great right, to be right here. Right. So oh, uh, we must apologize. We've shot our time a bit. So we're supposed to have a break in between. But apparently, the first panel, they wanted, they were going to say everything. And I hope they've not even said everything we're going to say here. <laughs> I trust that's not the case. Have, <laughs> so we're trying to make it very quick. It's not going to be a very long one. Um, I can't find Mr. Babalola here. Olumide, please, can you confirm you're here? I can't seem to see you. Yes, I'm here. Oh, great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm discussing the panel two. That is at the topic of our panel session is, and um, that's um, the, the subtopic, right? The enforcement of data protection measures in AFCT. I mean, that's our uh, fifth I still have a challenge with that um, abbreviation sometimes, but it's fine. Should we call it after or after, whatever it is? In our, let's say, after member states, compliance levels, issues arising, and enforcement strategies. So the background to this conversation is, you know, talking about what has been happening, I mean, in after member states, basically. How do they actually go about with their compliance levels? When you want to measure this, I'm from Nigeria, and over here, we have, of course, we have our challenge as well. We have our challenges, there are a lot of issues so far to be discussed. I'm sure a lot of this has been discussed in the course of this panel. And of course, the enforcement strategies we should be looking at towards ensuring that we can actually enforce data protection measures that have a very, very uniform system across um, after member states. So I'm gonna be introducing my panelists very quickly. Yes, I'm, I'll do, read the citation very quickly right now. Uh, we have Yemi Adeniron. Yemi has over 20 years experience in cyber security, <laughs> privacy, I don't know if um, maybe my panelists could just mute in the interim, just so we don't have any interference. Um, yes. Okay. Um, in cybersecurity, privacy, governance, risks, and compliance, that is ISO, PCI, DSS, SOC2, GDPR, and NDPR, is international experience cuts across industries such as e-commerce, health sector, banking and finance, and telecoms. Yemi is the managing partner of Digital Hub, a cybersecurity and privacy startup in the UK and Nigeria. He's a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, IAPP, Information Systems Audit and Control Association, ISACA, British Computer Society and Institute of Risk Management, IRM. Yemi is a privacy advisor to ISACA UK board. He holds an MBA from the UK and certificates from IAPP. He's also a certified data protection officer, GDPR, certified privacy solutions engineer, CDPSE from ISACA, ISO 27001 ISMS lead auditor, and ISO 27001 ISMS lead implementer, and many more. Yemi is the author of several articles, including Data Protection in Nigeria, Enforcement in Post-COVID-19 Digital Economy, 
data security for accountants and private and finance professionals, central bank digital currencies, the challenges for African continental free trade area, and the healthcare data privacy checklist. That is Yemi Adeni, thank you for joining us. I'll go straight into um, Olumide Babalola. Olumide is a prolific and consummate digital rights, consumer rights, privacy, and data protection lawyer. His rich and diverse digital rights litigation experience spans across all superior courts of record in Nigeria and regional courts in Africa, including ECOWAS Community Court of Justice. He has specifically litigated on digital privacy, cybercrime, hate speech, freedom of information, online freedom of expression, passage of laws protecting digital rights, among others. Olumide is a seasoned conference speaker at local and international fora. He is also the managing partner of Olumide Babalola LP, a NITA licensed data protection compliance organization. Thank you very much, Olumide, for joining us. And I go to Senator Inhenye. Uh, Senator is a lead partner in Fusion Lawyers. He heads the intellectual property and information technology team of his organization. Senator was conferred with an LLB BL from the University of Benin, Benin City, Edo State, Nigeria in 2011. Senator Inhenye specializes in information technology and intellectual property law and a thought leader in both areas. A data guidance by one trust expert on data protection and privacy for Nigeria. Senator advises local and foreign clients on data protection and privacy and works with innovators in the technology space from intellectual property driven innovations to disruptive decentralized ledger technology powered innovations. He advises and consults for several players in the technology space. Following his work in this sector, Senator is vice chairman policy and regulations of the stakeholders in Blockchain Technology Association of Nigeria, CBAN, and a trustee of the African ICT Foundation. He is a member of the Information and Communications Technology, Intellectual Property, and Sports, Entertainment, and Media Committees of the Nigeria Bar Association Section on Business Law. Welcome, Senator. And finally, we have Oluleke Olatunji. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, on a lighter note, though, Senator's name keeps, you know, I'm using me a lot of time. We, we actually wonder if he's a Senator of the Federal Republic, but I understand <laughs> Senator is actually your, your actual name. Interesting. <laughs> All right, welcome again, Senator. So we have Oluleke Olatunji. He is a skilled information security professional with several years of experience and expertise in information security governance, incident analysis and recovery, audit process, project management, network and application security assessment and monitoring. He thrives in fast-paced, challenging and creative environments and have had success in both the banking and technology industries in Nigeria. So that is my panel, a very, very powerful one, I must say. And interestingly, our panel is, all, is, um, is, is actually a male-dominated panel. And I, I, I want to address this a bit just before we begin to have a lot of you know, uh, questions on is there a gender discrimination thing on this panel? No, there is not. Actually, um, a, a lady was supposed to moderate this panel, but um, for some reason, she wasn't available and I had to step in. So that's the reason for the seeming gender imbalance, if you will excuse me. So thank you very much again, Yemi, Leke. Senator and Olimide will be going right into it and doing some justice to the topic before us today. And we're looking at the enforcement of data protection measures in after member states, looking with focus on compliance levels, issues arising and enforcement strategies. And I'm just going to run through a quick paper here, not um, we just speak a few salient points there before we go into the real crux of the matter, which are the talking points for this particular panel session. Now, um, state sovereignty has been challenged on issues related to data, you know, um, in spite of the fact that the AFTA has made it um, a free flow of service and information possible, we keep having issues around this. And, you know, we, we need to ask ourselves, what steps do we need to take to ensure that information remains secure? Because when, you know, when, when trade is open, you know, in Africa and we allow different countries are able to, you know, interact with each other so freely, a lot of data exchange will take place. So we need to be very, very sure that what if, this country, country A, has data protection measures in place, and country B doesn't exactly have a, simi a similar measure in place. What happens when there's exchange of information or data? How secure are this information when it's, ex when it's ex um, exchanged? So we say a key component of the digital economy of international trade is recognizing and protecting data and implementing effective data protection mechanisms so that member states can fully benefit from it. 
So the, uh, I recall when uh, in Patricia's keynote address as delivered by Femi Daniel, um, she mentioned a particular incident of uh, a particular case of why it's important to have a uniform system of data protection measures that apply not just to particular countries in Africa, but a uniform system across every African or AFCFTA or FSTAR member states. According to United Nations Conference of Trade and Development in 2016, that's the UNCTAD, um, it defines it this way. It says data protection is directly related to trade in goods and services in the digital economy. Insufficient protection can create a negative market effect by reducing consumer confidence. Data protection is one of the most important considerations in a deal involving a lot of international data flow. Of course, we mentioned this already, where we have a lot of exchange of data. If there is uh, an issue of, you know, com any confidence issue there, it could actually affect the trade. So data protection is directly related to it. We can Have we lost the moderator? Is in my line? Um, it's Ash. Okay, yeah. I'm, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, I think I had a bit of internet connectivity issues. The apologies for that. So moving on. Said by way of contrast, the business environment on the African continent is harsh and narrow-minded on many fronts. Here, realities are what challenges us. For example, Africa seems to lack a wide range of rules and regulations for data protection. Basically, it's only a select, um, select number of African states, African countries that are actually, you know, carrying this to the latter. A lot of them just, you know, seem to do these things nonchalantly, You're right? So a lot of countries that don't have this um, data protection laws in place will give us a lot of concern, especially when we want to do um, our trade with them, considering that there are states who have already tried to implement these measures in place, and they also have to watch out for their own security and be sure that whatever data flows or data exchange is happening across these countries that there is at least adequate data security for them. Now, um, there are about two major legislations, or should we say uh, 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 the regional efforts, basically, in terms of on this area. We're looking at two things, basically, here now. First, we have the AFTA protocol on trading services. So based on the general agreements on trading services, that's the GATS of the World Trade Organization, it provided in Article 15C and Subsection 2 of the protocol that it said, um, and I quote here, privacy of individuals in relation to the processing and dissemination of personal data and the protection of confidentiality of individual records and accounts. The protection provided by this provision is not as good as the data protection regimes found in free trade agreements from other regions. So this is a question, a, a, a subject for this course there. So basically we find out that it looks as if what we have here it's not, you know, it's not, it seems not to be strong enough, especially when you compare with other regions like the European GDPRs and, and, and a couple of other legislation they have in place there. So we see that these are something we should be discussing in this particular panel session, right? To so see member states are exempt, that's member state of the after now, are exempt from many of the benefits of the after due to this restriction on trade. Due to the lack of a data protection law in a large number of African countries, as it stands right now, over 23 out of 54 African countries don't have any of such or don't have a, 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 a regimented system of data protection measures in place. Now, when we have the situation, trading with those 23 African countries without these data protection laws will effectively restrict the above provision as defined by the AFTA protocol on trades and services. Similarly, waiting for the other countries to implement the data protection laws before the agreement is fully implemented will be unfair to the rest of the region. Because basically we have a situation where we have, um, if you say 50 minus 23, we have about 31 countries who seem to have something, who have something in place rather, it's not to be correct, it's not correct. So if we have to wait for the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, others follow suit, right? So we cannot, it's not really going to be fair having to wait for this. Similarly, waiting for other countries to implement their laws before will be unfair, right? We said data protection provisions should therefore what be incorporated into the agreement to be followed by all ratifying member states. So the argument there is that if we want to actually pass this, then data protection laws need to be implemented into the AFCFTA agreement itself. The second point we had there, uh, we have there is the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protect Protection, that is the Malabo Convention of 2014. And there it's um, specifically stated that an electronic transactions, 
privacy and cybersecurity are all covered by this convention. Yes, we know that. Sadly, only 14 out of 55 member states have ratified the Malibu Convention. For the AFCFTA to function effectively, data protection provisions need to be incorporated into or annexed into the agreement. So it's still basically the same argument from both sides and insisting that if we are to actually have an after agreement that will stand the test of time, then data protection, data security measures need to be effectively implemented there. Due to the development of the digital economy in international trade, the world is becoming more integrated. African businesses with large scale operations would rather operate in areas with more developed data protection laws rather than in places with a weaker regime. So they want to be very sure if I have, if my country has a very, very strict and very firm data protection measure in place, I'll be wary because I know how much time it has taken my country to put this in place. So why would I want to interact with another or trade with another African country with a less serious or not as serious as mine, um, my country's data protection measures? So these are issues we're going to be encountering if we don't have a uniform system in place. Annexes and other types of subsidiary regulations on data protection are a part of many regional international trade agreements. Europe, for example, has ratified Annex 11 of the European Free Trade Agreement, that is the EFTA, which is part of the agreement between many other countries. Data protection in the European Union is discussed in this Annex in relation to electronic communication, audiovisual services, and information services. The AFTA requires the inclusion of specific provisions for data protection in keeping with international best practices. So now, by when we have this, when we ensure, when we insist and ensure that these provisions are in place, especially for data protection. What are the things that would happen eventually? We have about three things that I highlighted from this paper I'm looking at right now. It says, number one, we're going to increase Africa's competitiveness in international trade. And of course, we'll also improve confidence among member states and the external stakeholders. Second point there is that personal data exchanges are conducted in a safe manner because now there's a uniform regulation that borders on data protection measures. So because of this, countries feel more comfortable. We can now freely give a, do, a, a, do exchange of data knowing that they, they, have, they have secured data protection measures in place. And finally, the data protection standards are clear, ensuring rightful data flow is under control. The standards also ensure what? Mutual, mutual confidence among data protection law abiding and non-law abiding states. As a result, all African countries can fully take advantage of AFTA's benefits. So that's what I have before me. And this is going to form the crux of our talking points on this panel session. So please, um, the audience, everyone, you are free to jump in at any point. Please feel free to drop your questions in the question and answer section so any of our panelists can take it at any point in time, even as they discuss the talking points. So um, I'm going to throw the questions open. It's going to be a free flow. It's not going to be one-sided, of course. So at any point, I could call on any of you or any one of you could. I mean, among my panel, the panelists now, that is yourself, um, Femi, Olumide, Oluleke, and Senator, to jump in on any of the talking points we have here. So the first um, one I'm going to be looking at right now, the first talking point we have here is, is, is actually a question. It says, in many government offices, personal data of customers, guests, et cetera, are easily accessible and are not protected due to civil servants' reluctance to embrace digital methods of logging data. What are your recommendations to curb incidents like this? And before you, before we take this question, I also want to emphasize that, I mean, this applies not just, okay, I, I live in Nigeria, right? So the question seems to apply a lot to my country, Nigeria. But I want to believe that this also extends not just to Nigerian civil servants, but to Africa in general. So we expect that this is the same situation that is replicated across different African member states or after member states. So how do we cope such issues? So I, I, let me throw the floor open. Who wants to go first? I mean, Yemi, Leke, Senator, and Dolomide, you have anyone of you could go first. Let's attack that um, question very quickly. If you want me to repeat one more time, I could just do that. But let's see if um, anyone is ready to go. I see Senator smiling. Looks like. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's a great question. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful question to start with, because if you ask me, it's, it's the points that I always try to make when it comes to data privacy and data protection in Africa. Um, you cannot legislate into action or into existence something that is not already incorporated or integrated 
into the system or to be more specific into the culture of the people that's the fact it's easy to sit somewhere in malabo and say this is what the privacy and data protection rules will be it's easy to sit in abuja and ask our national assembly perhaps to bring up something on data protection but after all that at the end of the day the question still comes back to whether there is a data privacy culture that that is in existence or in place uh, if you ask me i see a poor level of um when it comes to the data privacy culture even data protection culture it's pretty poor it's really, it's really low in most developing countries including africa and perhaps the reasons for that are not far fetched it appears that the priorities of both african governments and african people generally is not really about privacy it looks like the the focus is more about fighting of those things that um you know you you know government likes to talk about when it comes to politics and all of that if you talk about the poverty level and all of that so i am thinking that the data privacy culture is not really there and so you find that people are not prioritizing the need for um having regulations or policies around data protection and privacy so if you go to a a, a, a public sector um agency for instance such as the government you mentioned it is true that the culture there is pretty poor when it comes to um being um data data privacy compliance and all of that as a matter of fact until recently it didn't even exist it had no meaning there and to date even in some private sector organizations there are people who still find strange the idea of privacy between employer and employee so if private sector is still struggling with it then think of what struggle um, the government must be having with that as well so yes it is true that we can always have policy makers um lawyers and all of them stakeholders come to the table and say this is what we need but again do we have that uh, that that culture integrated already in the system so i think that this comes back to the need for a lot of awareness massive awareness i'm aware that in nigeria for instance the national information technology development agency needs to has tried to push um, uh, um, awareness when it comes to privacy and data protection but it's not enough and it's obvious that nita can't do it alone we are yet we, we to change this i think that we need um a top down approach you know we are yet to really see it if you ask me i see um the the little achievements we've made so far or progress we've made so far appear to be that we are just trying to fulfill our righteousness because europe is doing it because uh, the U us is doing it we need to go to the grassroots and drive this idea better especially now that we have a data driven digital economy so i think how we can do it is to make do it it has to be generational you know you have to look at uh, all of the generations the older generations where well, generation z and um, the boomers and all of them we all have to understand and appreciate the idea of um data privacy and just to close this all right um i noticed something there is need for a philosophical shift as far as the idea of data protection and privacy is concerned now i see uh, that in most of africa the idea of data protection and privacy is isolated how do i mean we are not helping people understand that data privacy and protection is not just a legal or regulatory thing it's not just a compliance thing it's it's something that drives the economy and so the uk for instance will tell you that the reason why they have got gd uh, the gd uh, uh, what's it called general uh, data protection law or uh, regulation gdpr is because they see that there's a new economy coming which will be driven by data and they need to empower the citizens which is the europeans what is the african philosophy of data protection is it data protection for legal and compliance alone 
or is it data protection to empower the African people? I think that if we shift a bit away from compliance, regulation, and all that stuff, and move a bit into uh, um, digital, I mean, um, data, uh, data privacy for the purpose of enabling and empowering the African, I think we'll make some more progress because that way a lot more people will be more interested. So right now it looks like a compliance business. It looks like a business for lawyers. And the and I need that, of course, with all due respect, hasn't really helped matters by focusing too early on the data protection um, or uh, compliance organizations, DPCOs. So you see that there's so much attention on becoming DPCOs uh, and all of that. Everyone is talking about DPCOs and regulation and compliance. We've moved far away from what even uh, brought out the idea of the GDP how, which is economic empowerment. We need to move towards that a bit more. So that's that's my um, uh, contribution regarding that. Fantastic contribution, Senator. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure hearing you speak. Yeah, awesome. So before I take um, the comments from uh, the others, I, I I picked a few things from what you mentioned there. I, first and foremost, I recall you mentioning about the culture for starters. It's a it's a culture issue. What our cultural appreciation of data protection around here? So before we begin to talk about compliance enforcement and other issues, do we even appreciate what this message is? I mean, so it's important that is from what you're saying that we need to find a way to sensitize people better. Take this just beyond the compliance business as it looks like, especially in our part of the world, that is Nigeria as it is now. But remember, we are not just focused on Nigeria. We also want to know, we also want to talk about what obtains in other parts of Nigeria, other parts of Africa. What about other jurisdictions, the after jurisdictions? How does this actually affect them as well? I recall you mentioning the philosophical shifts Realizing the fact, just like it happened in the GDPR, the, what, what, what birthed the idea of the GDPR was the fact that the world was turning towards a data-driven economy. So what is our take? What is our stake here as Africans? What are we looking at? Where to shift from that current philosophy? Do we even have a philosophy, basically, is the question I'm taking from where you are there. So thank you so much, Snato. I don't know if um, any of um, my other speakers, here, yeah, panelists, also have anything to add to that. Um, Yemi, uh, Leke. Oh, let me, any Initially, I wanted to defer to Yemi um, oh. before, because I mean, the um, senator, I mean, he's a lawyer, Yemi is not a lawyer, so let it not just be that we're just bombarding it from the legal uh, point of view, because I mean, like I would always say that data protection is beyond just what lawyers do. I mean, it's just, it's not just for lawyers, um, it's not just lawyers' domain. I mean, Senator has spoken about the business side of it. But one very critical point that I keep saying every time I talk about data protection in Africa is, I mean, I mean uh, Senator spoke about the cultural, I mean, and the philosophical um, perspective. Yes, it is It is sad that the African Charter on Human and People's Rights does not recognize privacy. It says a lot about Africa. It says a lot about uh, the academic views of the West on why, on whether Africans value privacy at all. Because if our most important uh, Pan-African International Treaty does not recognize privacy, it says a lot about how we value privacy. I have litigated privacy and I say it every time that some, at a point I was in court and the judge asked me, okay, so your client's privacy has been violated. Uh, what has she lost? I mean, what, 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 what has she lost? I mean, it was it was a it was a shock for me because I have to now start schooling the judge on um, what someone has lost uh, in terms of invasion of privacy because sometimes when we do see the pecuniary loss, we just assume what about what about the psychological loss? What about the dignity? What about the uh, feeling of exposure? What about the security uh, uh, concerns? But uh, co coming straight to your question. First of all, what African governments need to do, first of all, is to imbibe the accountability and data governance principles. First of all, because I mean, when we begin to talk about data protection, the first thing we need to begin to look at is how exactly are we accountable to the people we process their data? How accountable are we to the people whose data we hold for businesses, for organizational uh, uh, practices, for whatever purpose at all? You have people's data, I mean, you should be accountable. They should know. So first of all, governments all over Africa should begin to think of uh, I am engaging responsible officers 
Call them whatever name you want to call them. You want to call them data protection officers. You want to call them privacy champions. You want, those are the people, those are the first point of contact for anybody who wants to know what your privacy uh, practices are. I mean, questions we have around data protection and data management. Uh, and once we have that, and we have round holes in, in round pegs, in round holes, then we cannot begin to build the culture, we cannot begin to build the internal policies on data management. This one should also be written. It should be, it should be uh, uh, publicized. People should know for every government, for him. Now, for example, the, the cabinet office published its data uh, uh, management uh, procedures and policies, and everybody could see, I mean, how, how it values the data. Even that's the cabinet office in the UK. How, how, how much it values data. So the African governments should begin to imbibe this. Now, you have responsible officers, you have internal policies that speaks to your data management practices, and people know. Then I also advise periodic audits. I mean, so whatever it is, there should be some annual. So in, uh, about two months ago, we, we, we launched um, a report on data protection authorities in Africa, and I was privileged to work on the report, and we saw how many uh data protection authorities we have how many laws we have in africa the ones that are comatose there are some laws that are not even enforced at all botswana botswana had their laws for about two years now thereabouts and there is no authority the law has not even started uh, um, enforcement i mean it does not enter commencement yet and there are some other african countries that are claimed to have data protection uh, laws and authorities but we can't see what they are doing and that speaks to accountability. I mean, so you go to their website, you can't see any report whatsoever. In the previous panel, um, Femi was saying jokingly that in the whole of Africa, we have three major fines. I mean, in the whole of Africa, we have well over 23 or 24 DPAs, and we can only talk about three major fines. And even the fines are not even major if you ask me. I mean, in Nigeria, we've had two very publicized ones. We have one of Soko loans, 10 million, and we have one of Lagos State governments that we, I mean, we, I mean, we have to, like, file an action before that one was even done. And it was one million. People keep saying that's a slap on the wrist. So for me, what is important for African government to do? Accountability stands on top for me. I wouldn't want to take much of your time. And please, I would I would apologize in advance. I, I will leave the session at 12.30 because I have another uh, engagement to run off time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that contribution, Olumide, and your apologies accepted. Thank you. I mean, we actually started the session a bit late, so we understand quite well. Um, um, so uh, three things I picked from what you, your, your intervention there, you talked about the need to imbibe accountability and the digital governance principle, and how basically how accountable are we to the people? Do they even know that is those we even say we hold their data, or we control their data, do they, are they even aware of these realities? Once we're able to, you know, sense, let them know about them, we can begin to build the right culture and framework for data management. Then, of course, you mentioned periodic audits too, how important it is from, from time to time to basically check what you have. Keep doing a periodic audits on the data we control from time to time. Beautiful. Thank you very much, um, Olumide. And I, yeah. I don't know if um, Yemi wants yeah. to come in there. Absolutely. Yes. Actually... Absolutely. I think just to add to what uh, Senator said and what uh, Olumide articulated very well. I think uh, on a scale of zero to five, Africa is still at, well, maybe between one and two when it comes to enforcement and compliance, and one go with each other. Uh, we, we still have a, a, a mindset which uh, we believe that data is nothing. Uh, we're trying to move from a oil sector into far more digital sector. I read, I mean, I, I get a lot of reports about all the investment in our tech hub, uh, flutter waves and all that, how they, you know, how they are attracting funding from abroad. And I keep reading about uh, NIDA trying to push for a more uh, regulatory power and authority to regulate you know, this, uh, this tech hub even more. I think we are, we, we are, we are just so much into bureaucracy and it's really, really, uh, making Nigeria and Africa uh, to be behind. We're really behind. Google announced a couple of weeks ago that, look, we, wanna, we want to invest $1 billion in Africa. Uh, none of these African countries, I haven't heard any of them, maybe you guys have, have come up and said, look, we'd like to sit down with Google 
We like to talk to them. We like to find out what is it that they want to invest the funding on. So we just keep going round and round in circles and keep pushing papers up and down. We approach, I won't mention names because of, you know, we approached a number of uh, agencies in Abuja to do audit for them. Uh, they pushed back. They said they're not answerable to NIDA. I said, look, this has nothing to do with NIDA. This is Nigeria. They said, oh God, we're not into data privacy. What is all this? You know, so the mindset needs to change. The culture of data privacy doesn't exist. You know, uh, the, 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 in the civil service, those guys, they are one of the problems of Nigeria. I have to say, you can quote me if you want, because they are so laid back. They don't really want innovation. They want to stifle innovation. They really push back on everything. One of them said to us, look guys, we report to the World Bank. We don't report to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Yet it's a federal agency. So the culture has mentioned has to change. And I will urge NIDA, one thing they could do is to put together what I would call a data protection guide for the civil service. It has to be aimed at each agency, not just a, a blanket data protection guide. It has to be like tailored to each agency, whether it's agriculture or education or whatever. You need to put a guide together for those guys so that they will know their roles and responsibilities under the NDPR. Right now, they do not know because they don't read. And also, they just can't be bothered. So you need to take that away, you need that, and make sure you put together a data. If you need help, let us know. A data protection guide that spells out each organizations in the public sector, their roles and responsibilities, what they must and what they, they shouldn't do. You need that because if you don't do that, we'll just be, we'll be back again next year talking about why the public sector are not embracing, uh, you know, data protection in Nigeria, in Africa. You know, we need to put something together. We need to look for solutions rather than keep moaning all the time. So please do something either about this. And also, NIDA needs to step up. They need to step up. They need to make sure they're ahead of the curve. Right now, they're not. In terms of enforcement, they are lacking. I will call NIDA her because I know them very well. I know NIDA very well, including their DG. They, they're lacking. They, they, they're looking at data protection as a subset of, of NIDA, whereas data protection should really domicile under uh, a commission or agency called Data Protection Commission. And I'm really, I'm really appalled that by now we don't have a Data Protection Act that is signed into law. We're still going around in circles. I, I listen to the minister speaking eloquently as he does every time. But you know what? We're not there yet. And we have a long way to go. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for that intervention, Yemi. Okay, a few take homes uh, from takeaways from your point there. Basically, you identified the fact that we seem to be running around in circles. Although I noticed, I observed rather that um, your intervention was mostly focused on Nigeria. I uh, I understand you. I mean, you work more with Nigerians and all that, but we also like to look at this from an African perspective, basically. So I also throw that open to the audience. If you have any questions, please, especially from those from outside Nigeria. Interestingly, my panel, this panel. Is made up of all Nigerians. Um, we want to also have thoughts, so, I mean, questions and comments, remarks from other jurisdictions. If you're also having similar issues, especially with the culture of data protection, especially from the civil service, we would like to hear what you have to say about that. So, so please drop your questions open. Any of the panelists can take up that question at any point. Um, Yemi also mentioned that um, we need to have a data protection guide for the civil service. I recall in May 2020, and NIDA came out with the NPIG, which is the, that, that's the public, uh, public institutions guidelines. I understand that that was quite exhaustive, I, 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 but no, I mean, that was not exhaustive enough, rather. And I'll take your point there, Yemi, where you mentioned that a guide that is tailored for each, every one of each agency in the civil service. Exactly. Because basically what applies is, yeah. So, so because basically what applies to one agency might not necessarily apply to another agency. So these guides, uh, so basically they, we need a revised version that's related to Nigeria now of the public institution guidelines that relates not just to public institutions as a whole, but narrows it down to each agency and having its own data protection guide. So thank you very much. And of course, the data protection act now, which is still, I mean, bill, which is still being deliberated on in Nigeria. But like I said also, let's move away from Nigeria and also see what other jurisdictions in Africa have to say about this question. 
Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll take Lika now. If Lika still wants to jump on this particular question, or we just um, move to the next talking point. Lika, over to you, sir. Okay, please let me know if you can hear me clearly. Uh, loud and clear. All right, so um, my um, fellow panelists have uh, made exhaustive contributions. I just want to look at it from a different perspective. Um, the way things work, I think, is especially for businesses and institutions and human beings, is what do I get to benefit from this? What's in it for me, right? So um, I think if we can, if we can package um, the evangelism of privacy in such a way that people see it as an advantage, as a business advantage, as a competitive advantage for a country, um, I think it might, it might sell a bit better with regards to the civil service, it might be a tough call until the current generation of civil servants uh, are phased out. But I believe as things get digitized, um, it's something that will probably um, be taken more seriously. Um, I also want to add that um, um, as regards um, um, data privacy as a whole uh, implementation, right? I think. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be as pessimistic as my co-panelist in the sense that um, everything in life is a journey. Every 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 progress is made. Typically, if you want to, if you want to make some substantial progress, is is done in an incremental manner. The first thing I think ha has been done is there's an awareness among a lot of countries in Africa, not all, about the need for data privacy. That's one. Some have put some regulations in place. I think those are steps in the right direction. When it comes to enforcing compliance, um, you need to get people to, I work, I, I work with a um, FinTech company, right? So you need to get people to see the advantage of privacy to their business. You need to get people to see the advantage of privacy to the country. You need to get people to see, not just saying, okay, it's a good to have. For example, in Europe, if you compare Europe and the US, um, data privacy is, at, is, is addressed differently. The Americans don't really care about data privacy so much. Their companies don't really care about data. It's when they move it, is, that, is, that, is, the, is the behavior of their companies in Europe, behavior of Google in Europe, behavior of Facebook in Europe that is actually being penalized. Within the US, it's not really something that we have seen them, except if there's a data breach. Right? So I think it also, it also drives from the culture of the, of the um, Society in question. In Europe, people are, are very privacy conscious. So until we, or we are also able to educate, like um, uh, Mr. Sinister said, educate and get people's personal buying to see the reason why your private data is very important and, shouldn't, and you should have control over it, uh, it might be a very difficult thing for us to um, enforce. That's my, that's my comment. All right, thank you very much, Liki, for that intervention. Uh, apparently, your intervention seemed to be the one that was a bit, you know, <laughs> shall I say, uh, a, a, a bit not, not, um, okay, I'm looking for a good word for this now. But my point basically is that, you know, while um, Yemi Olumide and the Senator uh, were more, a bit more controversial and more castigating, that look, we need to do better, you see it from a more mild approach that, yes, guys, slow and steady wins the race. As a step in the right direction, at least we have the regulation in place first. But you know, sometimes too, we could get very impatient with these things, especially when we know that these things don't necessarily need to take so long. We can actually achieve these things as fast as possible. And I'm going to take about your, your point about evangelism of privacy. That's a good one for me there. So basically, we need to see how we can begin to do more in letting the people know. Uh, it's the data protection is not supposed to be just a compliance business. People need to know what, what do they even know what it is? Do they even understand? Are they even able to embrace the culture of data privacy for starters? So thank you very much for that. Of course, the challenge with the civil service is, is, is a bit funny though, because if you ask me ordinarily, I would have expected that the civil service should even be the one that actually complying and then they get the private service to follow suit. But then, you know, it's the other way around, especially in our part of in Africa as a whole. And I believe this thing could, should change over time. So um, before we move to the next question, I'm going to put it. Please, please, okay. my, my, uh, I, can, please, I, I like to say something. I, I, I like, I like my, pa my panels to be quite uh, controversial. Yeah, yeah, so it's fine. I like see, it. That's, that's so the that idea. See, I love so the controversiality. We can see from different perspectives. I, I, Lake has made an excellent point, like Dr. 
I want to borrow a fantastic point. And I like the fact that he's been mild. I mean, the fact that he works with the fintech company, yes, I, I understand your uh, proclivities and then why you would ordinarily approach it from that view. But we should never forget, privacy originated from the US, not even from Europe. It started from the US as far back as the 18th century. Anybody that is tracing history of privacy will trace it to two lawyers, some two lawyers who finished from Harvard and wrote an article on the, in the Harvard Law Review from the US. That's one. Now, talking about how US takes privacy as well. US does not even do all these, most of all these functions. US goes for class actions. And the biggest class action settlement that um, Facebook, Google has had, go, just go and look at it. Huge, huge settlement. Now, and, and why US is even better for me than Europe, Europe finds uh, violators and the fines go to the government. But in class actions, it is the people, it is the victims that get compensated and big time. If you look at recent, much recently, Facebook still set to it. I mean, still set to the class action, huge, huge millions, millions of dollars for people. So uh, while I agree with the fact that, yes, uh, let's, let's, well, I wouldn't even completely agree with you. Privacy data protection in Africa is 20 years, 20 years. If we take 20 years to get our acts right, I mean, and we are not even getting it right, just like Yemi said, in the scale of one to five, if Yemi is, is um, magnanimous enough to give us two, I am not sure I can give two. I am not really sure. If we have done something for 20 years, the first uh, data protection law in Africa was passed by Tip Vat in 2001. And when they did it in 2001, they did not set up a DPA until like some 10 years later or 11 years later. So the law was just there. The first DPA in Africa was, was set up by Burkina Faso in 2007. Yet, we are still where we are. I mean, if we continue to, to cut ourselves some slack, then we might not move as fast as we should move. A lot of money is going into this thing. A lot of effort, a lot of energy. Uh, maybe, maybe practitioners, maybe we are not doing enough, I agree. But to say that uh, slow and steady, we are not even, we are not even steady. We are not even, I wouldn't even say we're slow. So, I mean, if, if, if we set this kind of bar for ourselves, then it means we won't move. A lot of countries are doing very... TikTok is being fined all over the place. Facebook is eating it. Google, even in America. So if Africa, we have the law, and we have the laws, if about 50% of African countries have uh, data protection laws, yes, we can't see our improvement. Then what are we talking about? We have the Malabo Convention. African people have refused to ratify it. 15. We need just 15. We have 14. Then I, I don't even understand why you would set up a convention and you would say that uh, until 15 people ratify before it becomes operative. Why? They met in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea to, to, to adopt the convention. Why can't it become operative immediately? That we have the ECOWAS in, in West Africa. It's not even applicable in Nigeria because Nigeria has not domesticated it. We have not domesticated the ECOWAS convention. So it's just there. And it was ratified in Abuja. It was adopted in Abuja. We have the SADC model law in South Africa. The model law is just a guide. It, is, it has no force of law. The Eastern Africa have the legal framework. It is also just a guide, no force of law. So, I mean, Africa, it's, it's time. It's, this is the time for Africa to have a pan-African instrument that can be as possible, that does not even require a ratification, just like the GDPR. GDPR does not require, it is immediately impossible. You don't need to say you want to ratify. It's the regulation that goes into enforcement immediately. Although, yes, governments need to do some form of transposition, or, I mean, have their, their own, but it is, it is, it's applicable all across Europe. So as much as I appreciate your fact, I mean, your, 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 uh, um, your, your, your intervention, but sure, I think yeah. we need to push ourselves more in Africa. Sure. Thank you very yeah. much. I'll be running out of any, any moment from now. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Elimide, for that. Okay, so I think we have a question quickly, so we'll just really take that um, from King, uh, Kingsley Duru. Uh, I don't know if you want to ans ask your question live. If you want to, please, can you unmute, uh, can you admit, can you unmute Kingsley so you can quickly ask this question live so any of the panelists can attend to that. Kingsley Duru, please. Can we allow Kingsley to speak, please? So why would do that? Okay, Kingsley, if you're allowed to talk now, please unmute yourself and just go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I've done that. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Kingsley Drew. I'm the data protection officer of Heritage Bank. I want to ask 
you know, because from what I'm hearing here, we're talking about privacy, privacy. What's the difference between data protection and data privacy? Because uh, from I, I listened to the senator when he was talking about this issue of uh, culture that we are not making any headway in Africa or in Nigeria, but which I don't quite really agree with him because from what NIDA has done, the consciousness they have raised when it comes to issue of data, you know, protection in Nigeria cannot be wished away. You, you have seen so many, you know, some companies have been sanctioned in recent times. Especially those who have been doing, who have been dealing on micro, you know, uh, credit. They have been using people's data without consent. You know, sending SMS threatening people, you know, without you know even getting consent to you know use your your number. So I, I wouldn't really agree. So I want to know what is the difference between data protection because when you look at what is happening in America, we are talking about America here. No matter the advancement of America. America this year alone, in terms of breach, when it comes to breach, in terms of data protection, America has suffered so much loss. We, we know about the, the colonial pipeline, you know, that caused a lot of issues for America to the first, you know, for the first time that America experienced queue on their, you know, in their filling stations because of that breach. And that is a data protection issue. So, so I want to understand what the, the difference between, because we have been talking about privacy, privacy, and when it comes to privacy, to me, it's limited. So what's the, the difference between data protection and privacy, you know, in a broader view? Thank you, that's my question. All right, thank you for that question, King. So I'm just gonna allow one minute. Um, I think, let me just, uh, I think, Yemi, I want you to answer that in just a minute, please, very quickly. Yeah, um, I think the question answers itself. First of all, I will employ you to uh, enroll on the NDP uh, uh, data security mm -hmm. training course, if you may, uh, because at this level, if I have to be answering such question, I think we're, we're back to the elementary side of things. So please reach out to Benga uh, Shile to, to enroll on the course. But data security, well, data protection and privacy, they're the same. Americans call it privacy. Uh, the EU call it data protection. They, they serve the same purpose. It's just a, a, a use of, I was trained by IEPP. So all our training was on data privacy. Are you with me? But if you train in EU, you'll be trained on the data protection, EG, EU GDPR. Both serve the same thing, it's just a terminology. It's like saying Echo and Lagos, you know, it's more or less but the same. So that's the no, basic. Sir, I don't, I I don't just... quite agree on that. <laughs> okay. I don't. Uh, okay. If I mean, let's <laughs> not jump in. Okay. One minute, please. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, if I could just jump in and, and, and take my uh, Okay, okay. I, 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 let's I allow them to just do that. In I, one I, I apologize. This is, I mean, offline or online, anyways, myself and Dr. Motubura were discussing that. It's an issue that will continue to be controversial for as long as the subject. Uh, exist. Uh, it could be academic in some form. It could be a legal issue, and in some form, it could just be practical. So, asking you about, I mean, take, bringing it down to the Nigerian situation. So, uh, data. Anytime we say data, we know data is information. So, if you say data privacy, it means information of privacy. If you say data protection, it means information protection. Now, under our own constitution, we would have a, an element of information privacy. I mean, depending on who wants to argue with it, it's very arguable. So, uh, Kingsley, you don't have to agree with anybody, please. I mean, whatever we say, it is subjective, it is opinionated, but you really don't have to agree with anybody. But I agree perfectly with what Yemi said. Data protection is what they have in Europe. Data privacy is what they have in America. And it is just conceptual. You Whatever concept you want to. You might say data protection is wide, it's bigger than privacy, it is, but they are intertwined. You cannot discuss data protection without talking about privacy, because what does it seek to do? It seeks to protect people's privacy. You cannot discuss data privacy without also talking about data protection, because I mean, but they are just conceptual and they are terminologies issue. For some textbooks, they might be on data protection, but they will tell you they have adopted data protection because that is the terminology the feel comfortable with. I have seen authors who have written on data privacy and data protection in different breadth. 
So, I mean, I think it's just a conceptual, uh, while some people will continue to argue from now to tomorrow that privacy is separate, data protection is separate, there are so many concepts that I also tell uh, you they are intertwined. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I, I, I'll, have, I'll have to take my leave. No problem. Thank you very much, Visa Olumide. Thank you, Valola. All right, quick one. Um, okay, I can see Ol Olulike dropped a comment there very quickly. He said that data privacy defines who has access to data while data protection provides tools and policies to actually restrict access to the data. Well, that's another thought. That's another thought. I mean, I don't think one who, I mean, that like, like Olivier mentioned earlier, and it's subject to, you know, personal thoughts about it. You don't necessarily have to agree with anyone. Yeah, I think we've lost uh, our moderator. Apologies, sorry, sorry, I was muted there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, yes we can. Thank you. So we said, are there any measures? That's the second question now. Any measures currently in place to make sure that African countries that are yet to enforce data protection laws in their countries do so? And if they are, what success rate is expected from the measures? So um, I want um, Senator to go first on this one. Then Leke, you jump on the next, you jump on it next. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think it was in a business day program on after about three years ago. Uh, I made an observation regarding the after uh, agreement and its, its implications on how adequate it is when it comes to uh, protecting uh, the rights that we need to protect, whether it's data, whether it's uh, uh, um, other rights in the information space. Now, if you look through the entire after agreement, you will not find the word digital. For an agreement that was prepared or drafted in the digital age or digital economy, you would wonder why that is so. And that takes me back to what I've been saying, that when it comes to um, data privacy or data protection in Africa, there is, there is this, this critical need for us to look at why we need to protect it, because people don't understand it yet. Now, what are the measures being put in place across Africa to ensure that we have um, data protection, data privacy in, in, in the different African member states? Well, I think that would depend on one, the, uh, the, the protective infrastructure you're looking at. If we're looking at the infrastructure provided uh, by the African Union, of course, we'll have to look at that uh, uh, cybersecurity framework provided by that union. And so far, it's not, not, not news anymore that we are yet to even have that get uh, into operation because we're yet to have enough um, signatories to that agreement, right? So um, what, uh, what, what is being put in place? First of all, we want to ensure that each country, each member state has its own legislation when it comes to data protection or data privacy. So far, perhaps about half out of 54 African countries have that right now. Others are still working on it, and there are others who don't even have an idea about what is going on or no, have they said anything about what they intend to do about data privacy? That's one. Um, secondly, there is need, uh, as a way of getting members on board, some people believe that if we cannot get the national, uh, uh, the, the, legislation, uh, the legislation in each country or member states, step up legislation on data protection and privacy, perhaps one quick way we can do it is to have one single uniform data protection framework that comes from up there. And then all you need to do is have people just sign it. Now, I, while I understand the need for that, and perhaps that will even boost uh, uniformity more, because we don't have want to repeat the um, fragmentation we already have as far as trade and commerce is concerned in Africa. If we repeat that kind of fragmentation at the data level, it, it might really be a problem for us. So yes, 
that's another way. But so far, I do not see that really happening or being successful because many governments, many African governments, especially South Africa, for instance, or Kenya, or perhaps even Nigeria, may not be very, um, they may not be in a hurry to want to go for one uniform um, data protection framework for the entire Africa. The reasons are very obvious. One of the reasons is this. When you believe that your economy has more competitive edge when it comes to the use of your people's data for all sorts of data related services or information technology services or even by fintech services, you want to be sure that you are not opening your gold mine to other African countries who may just take on due advantage of that. So you, you find that if you look at where most breaches are happening across Africa, when it comes to data breaches, Africa, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, the reasons are not far-fetched. These are the leading economies, as far as I know, in Africa. And so they have more data-driven activities going on in these places. The digital economy is alive. If you then force those countries to an African-wide, one-for-all, um, one-fit-all um, uh, data protection framework, you're going to be creating a lot of problems because you, 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 we do not think, and I do not think, uh, that we are at the same level when it comes to one, awareness, when it comes to two, use and, uh, and access to this data or sharing of this data. So I think that we need what we need to do is to really look at each country having their own data protection laws or regulations. And at then at the continental level, African level, we can just adopt general principles within which these, uh, the legislature or the subsidiary um, bodies of each country can look at and work with. That's what I think we can do. Um, other ways that this has, has been measured in terms of how member states are, are doing uh, regarding data protection, I, I, I've mentioned first of all that the, 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 the bodies creating the Malabo Treaty, the bodies creating all of the one Africa, it's not going to work. Secondly, I've also mentioned that we need to allow uh, spe spe specific countries drive their own data protection laws and regulations, right? And uh, there is, right now, I don't know which body is really uh, checking how far each one has gone. Uh, I only know about private sector driven initiatives where they seem to want to check how each country is doing regarding compliance, where, regarding whether countries have laws or regulations on ground. But I haven't seen any, any, any uh, uh, initiative regarding how to police how far each country has gone. And I think this is what, why we also need some level of um, PPP arrangement, I mean, uh, uh, public-private uh, partnership, so that we can have some of these things that, that have been done or about to be done or already done, captured. And this is why I have to use this opportunity to really commend guys like Olumide, uh, who has been trying to actually put some of these reports together. I also am aware of uh, people like Tech High, who have always been also doing some work in that area. And of course, those persons who have sponsored this program, I am aware that they've all been taking some initiatives regarding, you know, putting, they having some some ways of measuring how far Africans have gone when it comes to um, data protection and privacy for all. I have to stop here to allow that speak as well. Thank you very much. I was just about to stop you, but uh, point taken. Thank you so much. Um, let's take you, Leike. Uh, you still, uh, any, any thoughts on um, the question at hand here? Yeah, so um, I'm very privileged because for me, being on this panel is a privilege for me. Um, my, my, my background is more technical and uh, security and risk based. So I've been able to see things from various perspectives. So I really appreciate what uh, Mr. Sinito has said. And I think that, uh, like um, uh, Mr. Yemi has said as well, um, 
and I think Mr. Olu, Mr. Um, yeah, uh, Olu Mide, uh, yeah. Now he said, said something which I find very important that um, we have a few agreements that have been um, ratified, right? So what I would suggest, what I would think, the approach I think we should make is what, we're, what has been ratified should be put into operation by those who have ratified it. And there should be a way to, um, by the time folks uh, put it into operation and they get to interact with each other, exchange information and create businesses out of that interaction and start making money out of it. Other countries will see the value in it and probably want to jump in. I'm sorry I keep talking about money, but at the end of the day, uh, every business, every country is about what's in it for me? How am I going to make money? How do I get an advantage of being in this kind of um, framework, employing this kind of framework? So as it is right now, like uh, my fellow panelists have said, the, the level of um, implementation is pretty low. Level of compliance is even worse, right? But what has happened is there are a lot of technology companies that, are, that already interact on a certain scale across Africa, right? For example, Flutterway, um, they, they have they made some moves, moves in East Africa, made some moves in South Africa, Pakistan has made some moves in South Africa. The moves they make have a foundation of technology under the when we are speaking of privacy and data protection, I'm going, I tend to look at it from a digital side because non-digital data is difficult to, um, before you can protect something, you must be able to identify it, right? So it's difficult to even um, identify, it's difficult to capture, let me put it that way. But if you if we look at it from the digital side, most of these interactions will be done via APIs, systems that are already existing. So I think whatever, I think it might even be faster for us as Africans to do this. If from the top, as Senator has said, there are guidelines that say, okay, if you're going to exchange data, it must be in certain formats that protects customer information. And these are the strict formats that, that are permitted. Now, different countries can come up and say, okay, in addition to this format, we also like to have this and that. But all, all those subtleties can be put in place. But in addition to that, there should be financial benefits. For example, if, if a business in Tanzania is pulling data from a company in Nigeria, right, there should be costs associated with it, so that I can charge them for pulling it. Nigerian government gets tax from that money. The business gets tax, gets funds from providing that information, and the Tanzania company can then use the data to do whatever they want to do for their business. So that way, everybody has is fair, right? Um, the country, the host country that owns the data benefits from it. The business in the country benefits from it, and the other country has access to the data. So I think. We we'll still have to have more robust conversations around this, but it's important, as Senator has said, we need to have um, an agreed, at least an agreed set of guidelines, um, Africa-wide, to be able to implement this going forward. Thank you. All right, thank you right. very much. Oh. Okay, okay. Yemi wants to jump in. One yes, minute. absolutely. Yes, uh, real quick. Let me just add one or two things here. Of the fifty-four countries in Africa, twenty-seven have uh, data protection legislation. Nine have draft protection uh, legislation, and 13 have no legislation whatsoever. This is uh, a UN stats I've just uh, provided. Now, those that have no uh, form of data protection legislation or previous legislation, I think they are losing out. They are losing out in the sense that the data protection ecosystem is changing. The uh, digital maturity is evolving day in, day out. Businesses are now building uh, presence on the net. Data are being collected from their citizens. Those data are being mined, they're being processed, they're being used and digitized. So those nations to address your question that haven't really enacted any form of uh, data protection law, they are losing out. And they're gonna continue to lose, to lose out. Because now with the after, uh, now working on the Central, uh, central bank digital uh, currency, which the CBN in Nigeria will launch shortly. Ghana is in the process of doing its own. Uh, Kenya is working on one. The idea is that they're gonna move payment to a digital side rather than uh, using fluctuation, uh, fluctuating currency. So it'd be easier for the guy in Gambia to buy something in Marrakesh and, and pay using the digital uh, currency platform. Now, that in itself brings its own uh, risks and cyber, cyber risks and information security risks. Now, if you as a nation, you don't have a, 
uh, data protection law enacted, you're going to be losing out because there's no way you'll be able to, 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 to actually monitor what is being done with your data. There's no way you'll be able to measure what is being done with, the, uh, with, the, with your data. And there's no way you'll be able to trade successfully with the rest of the world. Now, if you look at the banking space, currently in Africa, it's very saturated. Take Nigeria, for example. Nigerian banks are now going outside Nigeria to expand in Kenya, in Gabon, in Senegal, in everywhere. Now, if me as a country, I have no data protection law enacted and a company from Nigeria, a bank from Nigeria or Ghana is coming to, you know, to open up in my shop, how do I monitor them? How do I make sure they're in compliance with our, with our data protection laws? How do we enforce compliance? And how do we make sure, first of all, that the data they're mining is to the benefit of our people rather than they taking it to where they came from? So there is a whole ecosystem that is opening up, which to answer your question, if a, if a nation hasn't got a, a data protection enacted, they're going to lose out big time. They're going to lose out big time. The payment system, which I will talk about later on further than the line, is also opening up. Huge ecosystem is opening up that those nations that have no data protection law will lose out in my view. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Yemi. Um, so before we move to the next question, they, I just, uh, let me just remind our audience that you're free to ask your questions, please. You could just type in the chat box or raise up your hand if you want to um, ask any question live, you could unmute you and you get to speak. So uh, before we came into this, okay, I can see Dr. Kemi Motsubara dropped um, a chat there also, responding to King Siduru's question earlier on about the difference between data privacy and data protection. So she says here now, if I may, uh, privacy is a broad concept, covers different aspects of life. It is relative. Data protection is a set of rules for sharing data which must be shared. You may choose uh, to not share your information on privacy grounds, but you cannot refuse to disclose personal data because it is needed. All right, that's another opinion there. So, um, Kingsley, that's another one for you there. It also depends, just to add to what she said, it also depends on the personal data. There is also the SPI data, which yes, you can't yes, yes, yes. collect. Yes, it's close, just that. All right, thank you very much. Um, um, we're going to go into the next um, question. That The next talking point we have is number three. It says, how can the compliance level of states that have already implemented data protection measures be monitored. I mean, I believe the after, this after, after member states now that is, how can the compliance levels be monitored? How can the compliance level states of um, level, level of states have already implemented data protection measures be monitored? Is there a particular metric? So how do we get to do that right now? I mean, so uh, let me start from Yemi again this time. Absolutely. I, I think from a monitoring standpoint, uh, monitoring is vital. Uh, as we know in technology, you have to monitor your infrastructure, you have to monitor your environment. But from a data protection standpoint, and um, from uh, to answer your question, governance is key. Governance is number one. There's going to be a governance in place. We're working on a massive uh, digital ID project right now. And the first thing we did was to put a governance in place. Governance actually underpins everything. So those nations that haven't got uh, data protection law, I, in terms of the implementation and how we could monitor them, we need to put a, a governance in place, oversight. We need to put an oversight in place. Oversight is massive. Reporting is key. We also need to open a consultation on a series of reforms. To me, data protection laws for Ghana, Nigeria, and some others, they need to be overhauled. Things are evolving. The digital, the digital platform are evolving to the point that a lot, I was reading the transparency principles on the, on the EU stuff, and they are overhauling it. Look at the UK Data Protection Act 2018. They are overhauling that because things are moving so quickly now that you can get away from, uh, you, you can exploit these loopholes to get away from a lot of stuff. Uh, if you look at what is happening now, we have a scenario where uh, in Africa, the SME employs 48% of the labor force. Now, if you're as if as a nation you want to implement, you don't have a data protection law implemented, and you want to implement one, how are you going to go about it in terms of monitoring? If you don't have one in place, 
You need to make sure you have governance in place. You need to put an oversight in place. You need to make sure you have a reporting body in place. You know, these are the things that I think as Africa and as Africans, we need to help the, the bodies. Also, I noticed that Africans are always very reluctant to ask for help. You know, you, you have a look at the Data Protection Commission in, 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 in Ghana, the NIDA in Nigeria. I spoke to the guy in Morocco, very great guy. They, all, they, they have so much to learn, but they're very reluctant to reach out to the experts in the field. In Africa, they don't have to reach to Europe. They can reach out to folks in, in Africa that are very, very knowledgeable to help them. It could be on a consultation fee or whatever it is. It could be pro bono. Now, they need to make sure that they try and reach out to all these folks because they cannot do it all. NIDA cannot do it all. I told the folks in Morocco, you need to reach out. You don't need necessarily need to reach out to folks in Nigeria if you don't like them. You can reach out to folks in Morocco. You can reach out to folks in Accra. You know, can but then they need to modernize. We need to reform. So reforming the, the current law for those that have had one like Ghana for so many years, it needs to reform them to, it needs, because they need to shake up the whole environment. They need to shake up, a uh, complete shake up that will drastically improve uh, governance, that will drastically improve oversight, enforcement and compliance. They need to make sure they, they try and do all these things. So for me, I think that's what I would do from a, from a monitoring standpoint the oversight, the reporting, the governance, the overhaul of the framework, uh, also the consultation on a regular basis. Uh, those are my points. I think we've lost our moderator, right? Uh, Senator, do you want to go next? Because I think... Uh, All right. All right. New moderator. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I agree with you. Um, yes, those uh, monitoring, uh, those ways you could monitor what's going on as far as data protection is concerned here in the country, um, they're quite helps. I would like to speak to the um, report inside of things. Um, we usually it notices that whenever there is a data breach in some more advanced economies, such as the US, for instance, uh, it gets to make, make certain people feel, or certain people feel uh, wrongly or rightly, that these are the places where data breaches are happening the most. And that's not always accurate. Um, we find that why in we have data breaches often reported in the media in the US is not because someone necessarily leaked them. It is also because there is there are uh, statutory requirements or regulatory requirements in place in these jurisdictions that require data people who who are uh, require entities that process data, that share data, that collect data to report when there is a data breach. Now, how far have we gone in places like Nigeria, in South Africa, in Kenya, in, in Ghana, Uganda, Ethiopia, about reporting data breaches? Now, I noticed from the um, latest legislation passed uh, made in, in South Africa recently, is the Cyber Security and um, uh, Cyber Crime Act 2021. It's mainly focused on reporting data breaches. And I believe that is because apart from Nigeria and Ghana, we've had more data breaches from South Africa. Now, authorities are concerned, regulators are concerned, uh, owners of these data are concerned, and so that has amounted to some pressure on legislature to pass this law. Now, if we bring that side by side with Nigeria, how much of reporting is happening in Nigeria as a way of monitoring data compliance in the country? Um, how often do you do you hear from the central bank or from a bank in Nigeria, for instance, that it has suffered data breach, and this is the nature of data breach, this is the date it happened, and these are the effects, so that other banks and other financial institutions can also 
take one or two lessons from this. So I think that in, in, in improving uh, monitoring of data compliance and all of that, we need to go uh, into, we need to ensure that we have proper and well-defined guidelines when it comes to data breach reporting. I don't think we have that. There's a Cyber Crimes Act, uh, the Cyber Crimes Act in Nigeria that has some resemblance of data breach reporting, but there is no specific guideline on how uh, the all those collecting data, processing data, and sharing data will be able to, you know, report these these breaches. And should they fail to within a certain period, what are the consequences? The Cyber Crimes Act is totally silent on that, leaving too much room for discretion. And so people are not reporting data uh, breaches as they should. Um, the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation and most other regulations on data across Africa do not also have specific guidelines or requirements on data breach reporting. Do we have timelines? Do we have ways that these things are monitored? And should you fail to report a data breach, what are the consequences? Do we have the fines? We're not having those conversations yet. Um, it was last year or two, I had, uh, I was a speaker in a forum organized by the chief information security officers uh, of financial institutions, including all of the major banks and fintechs. And one of the things that I spoke about there two years ago was the need for banks and financial institutions to collaborate more so that they can uh, be more transparent about the data breaches they suffer. It was sometime in 2016, I read a, a report the first time about uh, over 6 billion uh, uh, naira being lost to data breaches in mainly financial institutions in the country. And you cannot really tell me that the central bank has ever reported this data breach as a matter of policy. Uh, we've not also seen our financial institutions reporting these data breaches um, uh, uh, publicly. So I think we need to start from there so that we don't, it doesn't look like we're just paying lip services and just speaking English all of the time. We need specific guidelines. I'm aware that the Central Bank of Nigeria has a data protection regulation specifically for the financial institution, the financial services sector. How far is the CBN ensuring that the CBN as a data protection authority in the financial industry, how far is it ensuring that all of the regulated institutions under it, including banks and fintechs, are complying? And apart from complying, do we have specific guidelines on data report, data breach reporting? The answer is no. So why are we not having those? Is the opaque system that we have so far regarding data breaches in the country, is it a matter of policy? Who are we trying to protect? Are we trying to protect brand reputation? But at the end of the day, eventually puts um, the, the, the integrity, data integrity in the digital uh, industry, in the digital market rather, in, 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 in a very uh, an awesome situation. So I think we need to go back to look at that, whether it is a matter of policy that financial institutions and other sensitive organizations will not stick with well-specified and well-detailed data breach reporting. So that's my, my take. I think that we should focus a lot on data breach reporting. But it is through this, we're able to tell what really is the, is happening. How do hackers work? What do they do? What are those vulnerabilities they take, they, they take advantage of? How is the phishing and hacking going on? What causes it? These are things that data breaches help us to know. But right now, we seem to be in the dark. Everyone is talking about data protection, data privacy, but no one is taking on any entity about data breaches. I read a report recently by one of the banks in the country I wouldn't mention. It's a fourth generation bank. You know, um, it's a Supreme Court report also, and it said something about data breach 
a massive data breach that happened in this country recently. And you could, we, I had to read that in a Nigerian law report because some persons who suffered, customers obviously, had to sue the bank. I mean, is how healthy is that? Should we not have a system whereby the central bank or the bank that was affected would have been already made this very open and transparent so that we can protect the integrity of the financial industry and other sensitive industries as well? So monitoring data breach reporting is critical and we need to take it seriously. All right, thank you very much for that um, intervention, Senator. Thank you also, Yemi, for your earlier intervention as well. I think Leke wants to say something. Yes, I just want to say, uh, make some uh, um, clarifications, if possible. Now, there are, um, there are data privacy issues. There are fraud-related issues. There are cybersecurity issues. Now, in some instances, when there is an incident, right, it cuts across both privacy, fraud, and cyber security issues. Um, most of what we consider as, um, I don't want to use the word data breach or hacking, basically, is things tends towards things around fraud and um, cyber security efficient, which you have mentioned, where customers are probably, they, they fill up a form and someone gets their details and calls them to get their token and does a transfer from their account. Now, I, 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 don't, I may not have the understanding of why um, those things are not exposed, but I know that they are reported. Because I've worked, I've worked with the, I, worked, I spent a few years in a bank control function before moving to FinTech. So I, I know that the CBN also carries out audits. And one of the things they ask for is, not they don't ask for, they review your records, they ask you questions, they look at your policies, and they ask for evidence of some of these things. Um, make sure that they have them in place. You get, so um, why, do, why some of these things are not made public, I'm not sure. But what I would think would be, be that, uh, considering the level of um, financial sophistication we have in the country, uh, exposing that kind of information to the public might, might, might cause a run of the affected bank, right? So I think maybe that's the angle from which the CBM I want to look at, look at that. So, might just be like a balance. It, it appears I appear to be playing the devil's advocate today, so just permit me. <laughs> right. So um, what you're touching upon is reputational damage by these yes. organizations. Yes, and, yes. You know, it's one of the consequences of data breach. So whether that data breach could be in any form, it could be a fraud, it could be cyber crime or whatever. But the emphasis should be on reporting, like Senator said. The emphasis should be on monitoring. And I I, I don't want to say this, but I, I'm reluctant to say it. I think, in, it, I don't want to use Nigeria as an example anymore, but it's doing my head in. I think Nigeria as a nation have this culture of covering up anything and everything that could adversely affect my friend or my friend's company. See, one of, one of the things you have to do in life to, for enforcement, apart from auditing, is name and shame. You got to call out organizations that are having data breach. You got to call them out publicly because if you don't, it means that enforcement will be just, you know, uh, another uh, cheap talk. And you know, in Africa, we like to talk a lot. If you've been, if you listen to us, we talk a lot. Uh, that's one of the issues we have as a nation. We talk so much, but with very little action. Enforcement should be part of that. It should be name and shame. Reputational damage is part of that. Why do you think the Google of this world, why do you think the Irish, uh, Irish um, data protection agency call out uh, Facebook the other day and say, we're gonna find you 38 million uh, euros because you've, you've, you've failed the transparency test of the EU GDPR. We need to call all these organizations now. We are papering over cracks and we expect things to get better. They ain't gonna get better because we will keep you know, you know, we, I don't want to name this bank. I don't want to name the organization. Oh, Alaji is the head of that company. I know them very well. We went to school together. You know, oh, they are my friend, they're my client. That is, we're still in that silo. We still have that mindset where as a nation, we still party party to use for last, for last stuff. And we want compliance. That ain't going to happen. You need to call out. You need to name and shame. Reputational damage is part of the, of, of, of the risk of data breach. 
and data loss. And you know what? I, I'm really sick and tired of Africa personally. You know why? Because we are we are just full of talk, talk, talk. Uh, you know, look at NIDA. NIDA should be out there. The enforcement unit is small. They don't have the resources. They don't have the funding. Yet, they want to get more, more power to go and start regulating innovators like a company. You know, yet, Google said, look, we want to spend 1 billion euro. Well, let's sit down with them. Let's see how we can get some of this money for Africa and for Nigeria. And let's see how we can help the startups like tax age. Let's see how, we, you know, there are so many opportunities. I will share, by now, I expect NIDA, uh, the Ghana folks, the folks in, in Morocco to have an advisory panel. I, I advise them to have a sandbox. I advise them to have various guides for various sectors, not just one big, massive 40 pages document that even the CISO will not read. Look at NIMSI, they're doing, uh, they're doing identity management. Look, your organization, you're, you're a startup. One of the issues with startup in Nigeria is, um, is, is, is privacy by design. You guys care less about privacy, you just wanna get out your app, roll it out, and then worry about privacy later. Privacy by design is key. I would expect NIDA and an other, other uh, data protection agency to be holding seminars on privacy by design. So when application designers are, are, are doing their coding, they will be, have a pipeline that will do the check on, 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 privacy, on privacy by design. So that privacy will not be an afterthought. It will, it will, be, it will be part of the, uh, the development life cycle, the SDLC. At the moment, things are afterthoughts. I could come to, I could stand up, look, I could stand up anything I want in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, wherever. No regulation, nothing. I would just go ahead and, and roll it out, get this stuff out. This company that they've just found 10 million, do you that started the, the same uh, model that they're using? They're from US, they're my friends. When they started it, they started in a lab with a professor, they had access. They have an algorithm they designed. They went into that, they designed it very well. But you know what? In Nigeria, we copy everything. Some folks like this company that was fine, they copy what they did, but they didn't know that the algorithm does more than they thought. Because they, where did they get that data from? How do they know that to fool me or call you when you default? Because they get the data from MTN, what the regulation. They get the, regu they get the data from XLA. They get the re uh, data from GLOW. The, the algorithm processes that data, checks the people you've been calling before you run away because you defaulted on your loan that you took from them. And then he said, oh, Yemi has been calling these six people. Let's target these six people because these who are taking loans and running away and they, they don't want to pay. I mean, that's, that's, that's another thing that is wrong with us as a nation. You know? So there's a lot wrong with us. But I always look on the bright side. So for me, I think from a monitoring standpoint, you need to put down an oversight. You need to make sure that reporting. Look, breaches. So many breaches are happening. Our company, we were the one that, over, that, that conducted the oversight for the Nigerian Bar Association's election. It was fraught with, it was fraught with people not agreeing with what's wrong. They, will have a, they had a spreadsheet that they were putting dates of each loss, and those dates, those spreadsheets were not really validated. You know, so the whole ecosystem was wrong. Now, when the election came up, they had an online election system that shows who was winning at a particular loss. They said, we're going to have a situation where we. But thank you very much. Don't let me thank say you very much. much. Nikki, thank you very much, Nito. This is I mean, we are gradually coming to the end of this panel session. And we're going to take the fourth one there. The question there is Are there any tools in place to track the effectiveness of the current enforcement strategies put in place? Are there any tools in place to track the effectiveness 
of the current enforcement strategies. That is where we have enforcement strategies at all, right? In some of those jurisdictions, what tools are anyone you've identified particular? I think I want to start with, um, let me start with Senator here. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, if I start now, they'll say Senator is being pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to allow this. Uh, but let's keep it very brief. Give our time. Yes. Yeah, one right. to take very, very, very quickly, in, in, a, in a market where uh, data privacy or data protection is not even been taken seriously in the first place, it will not be strange to find that there are no adequate enforcement strategies. And then when you move to the level of measuring uh, 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 the enforcement strategies put in place, their effectiveness or efficiency is even worse. So right now, I know that one of the ways that you can monitor how effective the enforcement strategies are being is okay. How many uh, 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 how many entities has the regulator been able to say you did this wrong and these are the consequences? If you look around you in Africa, in the entire African region, how often do we see that a, a bad actor has been punished for uh, infringing on people's um, personal on, on personal rights? So that's one side. Uh, I think as far as that monitoring tool is concerned, we are not doing well at all. I am not saying that we should uh, necessarily adopt a uh, 100% enforcement by regula regulation by enforcement model. Uh, one of the reasons I've always commended it is not there. So let's throw in all resources into awareness first before we pursue um, um, enforcement. But we are gradually getting to a point where we need to hit on that enforcement so that people take us more seriously. That's one. Secondly, uh, one of the ways you can measure compliance, how, apart from the regulators taking regulatory enforcement actions, how about the citizens, those people who own data? How often do you see in the UK, from Europe generally, and even Asia, Nigeria. Some of these cases are coming up gradually, but so far we are not seeing a lot of, um, we're not seeing class actions, first of all, to be sure, like we have in the US, and then we're not seeing those individual uh, legal actions by citizens who feel that uh, they need redress. And that goes to show that there might be two problems there. One, uh, regulations, the regulatory frameworks we have tend to focus uh, a bit more on protecting certain interests than the citizens themselves. So we need to have a citizen-driven data protection regulation so that we go back to that philosophical shift I talked about. I said something about um, the economic empowerment and not just regulation for regulation's sake. And then the second issue I see is we don't have the capacity yet, even in the judiciary, when it comes to um, um, administering and interpreting or um, uh, I mean cases when it comes to privacy and data protection in a country. So that's that. And lastly, lastly, one of the things I love about uh, the US or the UK is that from time to time, you find regulators coming to the people to say, these are the things that we have done in the last three months. These are the, the stuff we've done. These are the things we'll be doing in the next quarter and all of that. They even tell you how what they are thinking about the privacy. They tell you it's not law, but this is how we are thinking. And this is where we think Nigeria or Africa is going to. These are, this enables people understand 
you enable people to understand, hey, this is where the regulators are going. This is what they are thinking. This is how we should do. We don't have that in Nigeria or in Africa. We don't find regulators coming to us to explain what they are doing. And I think it's an accountability issue. I have been very fortunate and privileged, very quickly. Chile, I know you want to cut me off now. Uh, I've been very privileged to attend a program where the, the, the head of, the, of NITDA explained very transparently all the activities they've been involved in, those who were uh, complying and those not complying, and what they were looking at in the next one year. That was beautiful. Now, that was just for me and a few other privileged persons that were there. How about NIDA take it upon itself to say every quarter we'll be releasing a transparency report on data compliance and, and, and all of that in Nigeria? And then others too should do the same across other African countries. I am sure that this will help a lot. And, and so it's an accountability thing. We need to serve the citizens more. In Africa, it's usually the other way around. It's a master-servant relationship between governments and the governed. But it should be the other way around. We should be the masters. And governments, regulatory agencies should be the servants serving the people. So again, we need to change that orientation. Otherwise, this thing we want about data transparency, data pre uh, uh, integrity, all of that. We just be all paper and nothing more if we don't go back to the drawing board to fix these things. Um, Amy, you want to jump in there? I can't hear him. I can't seem to hear Yemi. Yeah, sorry, folks. I was on mute. You're muted, Yemi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, we. Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. We can okay. I was yeah. saying that um, uh, I think I mentioned uh, earlier that the Irish uh, Data Protection uh, Commission proposes a 36 million euro GDPR uh, GDPR fine against Facebook for allegedly violating the EU GDPR transparency requirements uh, to uh, Facebook not providing sufficient information to users regarding the company's uh, terms of service. And I see this a lot in Africa. A lot of organizations do not provide enough information about their terms of service. SLA are also uh, you know, wordly, uh, weirdly read, written in a way that you don't really understand it. Uh, so I think we need to move up from the mindset of um, now we, we to more uh, consumer awareness. We need to make sure that users are aware of taking data protection seriously by exercising their data rights uh, provided under the various uh, privacy and data protection laws in Africa. And then we need to make sure that uh, companies meet consumers' standard of privacy and protection. And we also need to future-proof compliance. What do I mean by future-proof compliance? We need to prove future-proof compliance with intelligence. At the moment, everything is still being done manually. To file a report with uh, NIDA, you still have to log on to this very clunky system to file a report. You cannot integrate with that system. There's no API integration. Efforts to integrate have been stifled off. Uh, in Ghana, what Ghana did was, the approach was different. They went out to all the big companies and they said, look, we are from uh, Ghana Data Protection Agency. Uh, this is the rule here. You need to comply. And rule number one said you must have a trained DPO. So therefore, we, we, we need to train your GPO. You need to appoint one, and we need to train that particular person. So this is the bill to train that person. That person needs to come to our office on this day, and so on and so forth. So they took the fight to all the big companies. They didn't sit back and employ DPCO, DPCO uh, way of doing things. So that's another angle of doing these things. I think I love the approach in Ghana because 
They made their presence felt with Guinness. They went to BA office in Accra. They made their presence felt. They went all over to all the big companies, most of all the big corporations from, from, uh, from abroad. They went there and pushed their, uh, their, their law and said, look, you need to comply. And this is the fine if you're not gonna comply. And for you to, be, to, for you to comply, we need to train your people up. So they trained up the GPO of each organization. And it's a must. In, 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 in Morocco, they are very more chilled about it. They're not doing that. They are communicating and engaging all the big corporations out there. You know, in Nigeria, we are employing the DPCO uh, way of doing things. I mean, there are risks and limitations with that because not all the DPCOs are, are, are equipped to do the job. Uh, I'm being honest here. And then the need of this world are also living the, the, the tech hub. They know really, right now, a lot of the uh, data protection agencies in Africa are not really engaging with those, uh, with, with the app designers and, and the coding guys because they haven't got the wherewithal yet. They don't know much about application security. So they need to really step up all these things and make sure that we are there or thereabouts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Jimmy. I'll just um, um, go to the last question and I'll allow Oluleke starts uh, with that. Our audience, please don't forget participants, you can still try send your questions. You don't necessarily have to wait until the end of um, the panel session to send your remarks, your comments, your questions, your comments at any point. So um, Leke, I'm going to take the last um, question there and I want you to um, attempt that for me before I go back to either Yemi or Senator. So the last question we have, what current issues are affecting the compliance level of state parties in the enforcement of data protection? You could just um, give us your quick thoughts there before we allow um, the others jump on it. So I think um, that question has probably been answered by some of the comments made previously. But I just okay. want to reiterate a few things. I think one of the things is the attitude of um, um, of institutions in Africa in general, right? So um, it doesn't appear to be like there's an understanding of the underlying need for data privacy. Um, and when, when the understanding for something is not known, there is no impetus to um, drive it. So I think for me, that is the major, that's, that's the key thing. It's not something, even, even in the is it Act for now, Act, Act for, uh, framework, it's just mentioned in like two sentences, right? So there was really no, there was really no attention given to it. So from that's the starting point. Um, Senator and um, Yemi have actually spoken a great deal about this during our conversation here today. It's important for governments to take an active role in this. The approach they, used to, they choose to take is left to them. But for a situation in which out of over 55 countries, just over half have ratified this, it shows that in Africa, we still have a long way to go as regards data privacy. So for me, I think the key thing is like any, any new thing, um, it's for, for, for those of us, if, if we have the opportunity to offer awareness session and training for governments, for states, for institutions, it's something I think we should take up because the more people know about it, the, um, what people know about it, the easier it is for people to do that. Okay, there's a need for this to be implemented, and easier for it, easier to be for it to catch up. That's the overlying thing um, I have. Because if if if, there's, if you don't see reason to, if you don't see the reason for something, you don't see reason to implement something. If you don't have, you don't understand the need for it. It's difficult um, for anybody to actually drive it. That's my that's the comment I have around that. Yeah, let, let me just add to that real quick, please. Okay. I, I think uh, co uh, compliance as it is in Africa is we have it in a way that one size fits all. Whether you are SME, whether you're a one man band, whether you're a large corporation. And I think we need to move from that mindset to, to make compliance not to be one size fits all uh, because organization currently face a disproportionate burden. You know, uh, a, a, a tech startup that's just starting, uh, being asked to, to be in compliance with 
uh, any of the African data protection regulation or law is a massive burden. So if you take the SME space in Africa, for example, the SME space, uh, the small medium uh, enterprise space currently employs 48% of the, of the labor force in Africa. And that starts from Google. And how on earth are they going to allocate time and resources to, compl to compliance that they do not possess? So I think one way of changing or reforming the data protection landscape, the digital ecosystem, and the digital maturity of Africa is to say, you know what, why can't every company be allowed to demonstrate compliance in ways more appropriate to their circumstances, rather than everybody must comply, must be in compliance with this. Because the SME with two guys that are just starting, their own compliance requirements should be different from Guinness of Nigeria or a bank in Nigeria and so on and so forth. So I think we still have this, uh, uh, and that is one of the, uh, uh, you know, one of the stumbling block to compliance that we still have this mindset that one size fits all in Africa and everybody must be the same. Every organization must be the same. Now the digital ecosystem is changing. Access to the internet, smartphone is still low comparatively. The digital platform website presence is going up. Digital maturity, however, is so different across Africa. You know, some business are digitally enabled, some are not. So we have an unbalanced landscape when it comes to digital maturity. And so for me, generating economic opportunity through technology is still not balanced. And so therefore, maybe we can look at compliance as not a one size fits all so that enforcement can be made easier. Thank you very much. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Yemi. Thank you for that, Yemi. Compliance should not be one size fits all but everyone should have be according to their specifications. Okay, so let's, um, Sinead, so you want to react to that very quickly. We have a question too from Baba Lola Omore. We're going to take that. Let's, let me hear you very quickly, Sinead, in case you want to react to the question on ground. All right, I agree with how that uh, my co-panelists have also um, pointed out already about the challenges that we face when it comes to data protection. But, uh, I would just like to add that um, uh, first, we need to improve on data breach reporting. Uh, that's one big challenge. Um, secondly, we need to make clearer what data breaches really are. I think that's one of the issues that we have. People tend to um, use that um, term in a very vague way. So we need to have uh, some kind of statutory or regulatory definition of data breaches so that people would know when um, they are caught. Um, also, uh, we've already talked about awareness. I wanted to talk about um, training apart from awareness because it's a different ball game. Uh, I think training should also be well targeted, uh, not just to um, lawyers and all of them, but to every uh, employ, employ, employee in any entity. That should be uh, paramount. And I, I know that some persons might, or many persons might disagree with me on this, but I also think that while we focus a lot of resources on DPCOs, we need to also see how uh, perhaps we could have a forum for DPOs generally, so that um, you can have those DPOs more involved in what is going on directly. I mean, so that we don't create, for SMEs that you know, you talked about um, um, gaming, I think they can also mention SMEs. It's SMEs want to be sure that they are not facing, um, you know, so much uh, burden when it comes to paying the PCOs and all of that. It's, it's, you know, they want to just have some kind, something direct, at least at their level. So I think DPOs should be brought more, um, um, they should be, be brought closer to the regulators. Another thing I would like to point out is that if we look at the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation 2019 very closely, in the definition section, there is a deliberate definition given to who or what a data protection authority amounts to. Meet that. 
I'm not sure NIDA will ever pretend that it is the only data protection authority in the country. The way that the NDPR is drafted is to assume that there are other data protection authorities who will be working alongside NIDA. That is how it's drafted. And so um, I would like to take the point from Yemi that we need more sector specific regulation in terms of data privacy. So I want to see NITDA working closely with the CBN, for instance. The CBN is the data protection authority in the financial service sector. Look at other sectors, whether health sector, there's the National Health um, Act. You can look for the custodian and work with them as the data protection authority in the health sector. So you go sector by sector and work with all of these data protection authorities at their own level so that you don't begin to go into regulatory tension and, and conflict where CBN will tell you we are the masters when it comes to data protection in, in the financial services sector and then we are rubbing shoulders. So there needs to be more collaboration based on the principle that a data protection authority is not a sole one in Nigeria. There are many data protection authorities in the country. There needs to be more um, collaboration and all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator. More collaborations, more synergy between different data protection authorities. Thank you. All right, moving on now, we're just going to take, um, I have two questions in the Q&A section um, from Baba Lola Omore. It says here, uh, please, what are the available NITDA's technical assistance to fintech in order to aid voluntary compliance with NDPR? What are the available, um, I, I believe it means technical assistance from NITDA to fintechs to aid voluntary compliance with the NDPR? I don't know if you want to react to that very quickly. And the second question is from, I don't, we don't know what the anonymous it says, what are the areas of convergence and divergence of data breaches and whistleblowing? I think I want to split this one. Um, I want you to, uh, to handle the first part there, the, what are the available leaders, technical assistance to fintechs in order to aid voluntary compliance. And I want to locate to handle the areas of convergence and divergence of data breaches and whistleblowing. Then Senator can just you know, jump on either one and call it a day there, just uh, take a closing remarks. I hope that's fine. So um, Leke, you wanna go first or Yemi wants to go first? Um, Yemi, you're muted, please. Right, can you hear me now? Can, yes, can you... it's loud and clear, yes. Absolutely, great. So I, I'm, I'm not um, too aware about NIDDA's technical assistance. Um, last time I met with the NIDDA's uh, 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 MD, I, I mentioned the need to have a sandbox, that NIDDA should put together a sandbox for the FinTech, an environment in which they can do their coding and they can also do what I call privacy by design. Um, but I think that fell on deaf ears because nothing has been done about it. So, but that's my take. Um, as far as NIDA is concerned about what they're doing, I know they do a lot of pushing uh, uh, on awareness. Uh, I know they engage a number of uh, government establishments. Uh, I've been spoken to about NIDA that coming to a few of us. On overall, I think right now, uh, I'm not sure. So I wouldn't like to answer the question. Thank you. All right, that's fine. Um, okay, Senator, any thoughts from you on that? 30 seconds. Yes, uh, I go with Yemi. I'm not also aware of any, any technical assistance uh, provided by to the fintech industry. Um, uh, if, if anyone has cared the fintech industry at all, it has been NITDA's bureau, NITDA treats NITDA bureau recently, which has been, which we have been told it, it was a leak of, uh, of a draft that is not yet uh, out there. But it didn't send a very good um, um, uh, body language to those in the fintech sector. So I'm not aware we're going to take this um, conversation over to Lida. I'm sure that if they have anything, they'll definitely let us know. Be sure to provide such updates. Okay, Oluleke, can we have your thoughts on um, the other question where we said uh, what are the issues? That question. 
That's all right. So um, I was going to. I, okay, I was going to. Um, it actually occurred to me earlier on uh, to talk about whistleblowing, but it, it's, it's a sensitive subject. Why? Because I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think there we have anything in a set of laws that protects whistleblowers against blowback. Right. So if a, if an employee discovers there's a data breach and goes to report independently to a regulator, I do not know if um, that individual has any protection or if there's a reward for him. Now, the challenge with that is, unlike in the US, where if if you carry out certain whistleblowing activities, you are protected by law, right? And I think in some cases, you are even compensated. Uh, I'm not sure we have that in Nigeria. Now, the convergence between data breaches and whistleblowing is that, um, especially for for a country like ours, as um, Mr. Yemi has said, where these things are a bit opaque, um, if we have protections for whistleblowers, it will be easy for people to come forward and say, okay, in social social organization, this is what has happened, but they're covering it up, and this is the evidence for it, right? So. Although there's a there, 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 sometimes there's a thin line between whistleblowing and um, corporate espionage, <clears throat> but um, I'm sure if you have a law in place, that can separate the two. So I think if we have proper whistleblowing protections in place, um, the reporting of data breaches, right, will be um, the, the more of data breaches reported will be increased because people will be motivated to do that. I know that okay, I'll still be protected. Now, without whistleblowing, it's pretty difficult to, especially when Nigeria is currently, it's pretty difficult to get um, reports on data breaches. It's be pretty difficult because um, there's really no incentive, incentive to uh, report them. Let me just add to that real quick on whistleblowing disclosures. If you, if you, anyone cares, they can download my article on the enforcement of uh, data protection in Nigeria. I, I spoke about the whistleblowing disclosures. The Nigerian Senate passed uh, whistleblowers protection bill into law in 2017. The bill was known as an act to, pers to protect persons making disclosures for the public interest and others from reprisals to provide for the matters disclosed to be properly investigated and dealt with. Um, For the purpose of the law alone, us should be able to introduce a whistleblowing policy to encourage the report of data breaches that are normally kept hidden or denied by the respective organizations. So the information received by the whistleblowing disclosure must be used to develop intelligence for further investigations and subsequent enforcement actions. That's my point. So read my article, it covers that extensively. So we do have that. Neither have not used that. Uh, hopefully when we have a proper data protection commission or agency, they will be using that because that's a, a massive power to be able to uh, you know, do a deep dive on all these organizations that are currently sweeping a lot of their data breaches under the carpet. Another point to take away uh, quickly is what I, I propose Africa should have what I call an Africa hub for free and responsible flow of personal data. That will aid a number of things. One, the uh, CBN um, digital currency, which they're all going to have to implement to aid payments of uh, goods and services between the African countries. So that will also encourage growth and innovation uh, right across Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much Yemi. Um, Senator? Just, um, yes, thank you very much. Yes. Fine. You can also just add your closing statements there. Anybody All right, knows? great. All right, great. So yes, indeed, there's a whistleblowers um, act in Nigeria, uh, but not surprisingly, uh, that has not been used uh, for the purpose of um, protecting uh, people. Uh, because uh, if you look at the uh, uh, it's, it was actually it actually emanated from Nigeria's anti-corruption policy program. 
So people see the whistleblower's act as some kind of um, statutory measures to ensure that people who blow the whistle against corrupt uh, um, politicians or uh, people who get all sorts of um, illegal activities in the sector or private sector are protected. Uh, I remember that one of the one of the uh, criticisms against the whistleblowing act was that it did not provide adequate protection for the whistleblower. And so it appeared that uh, Nigeria was just going to make uh, a scapegoat or victim of the whistleblower. And so it hasn't been as effective as people um, expect it should be. There's also been some kind of lack of transparency when it comes to the whistleblowing thing. We are not sure how much whistleblowers really get and whether it actually gets to them or uh, civil servants take first. So we, we are not sure about that. So that's what I want to say about the whistleblowing act. Um, by way of closing, I would like to say that we cannot legislate into law digital privacy culture. These things come naturally. We cannot also, at the snap of our fingers, expect that compliance should be perfect from day one. And so it's an evolving thing. What we need to do is to engage stakeholders some more. It should not be a one man has all the answers affair. Regulators should identify all stakeholders across board and be able to work more transparently and more openly so that we don't have a system where we seem to have all the answers at the top. But when those answers get implemented at the bottom, it's all not going to give you anything. So by way of closing, I'd like to encourage all, regula all the regulators in this space to work together more collaboratively. I do not see a lot of collaboration in this space. Sometimes I feel very bad for NITSTA because I see that while it is more like 10 years ahead, um, it's other agencies in, in government, even within the Federal Ministry of um, um, Information, I mean, digital economy, communications and digital economy, they are still struggling to catch up. So we all need to take ourselves along so that at the end of the day, implementation can be more efficient and effective. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Later, Leke, can we have your closing statements? Yeah, so I, I think um, for me, um, like um, Senator has said, there has to be a more uh, deliberate handshake between the policymakers at NITA and especially the private sector. Um, the office of the DPO, as um, Mr. Yemi has suggested, suggested, I think he suggested that, I'm not sure it was him or Senator, um, there should be, there's a committee of CISOs, actually Chief Information Security Officers, at least within uh, the financial sector. There should also be a committee, I don't know if there's a committee of data privacy folks, I don't think that exists, or if it doesn't, I think it's something that should come up. And they, I think having that will help drive initiatives such as this. Um, I also want to thank the organizers of this conference. It's been a very educative uh, on a personal note for myself. And I think it's something that I should, um, I'll be looking forward to next year to attend, attend as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oluleke Olantunji. Right, Yemi, over to you. Let's have okay. you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I think uh, this has been a great, uh, you know, uh, environment to kind of share our thoughts. We're not always going to be right, but you know what? We are pushing in the right direction. Um, I think we need to uh, push, keep pushing, and we need to open up this environment rather than try to. Need that should seek help. Ghana data protection. I've told them they should seek help. Also, all 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 others they should seek help because there are civil servants in NIDA. I don't think they have all the equipment and tooling they need to be able to do this work. This is a big job, and they should at least reach out to the, all the experts in the industry and get them together to help to forge a way forward. Uh, uh, from my standpoint, I think uh, we need to now go and start build, build back better rather than remain where we are and believe things will get better.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yemi, for that. So that comes to the end of uh, our panel session. We're discussing the enforcement of data protection measures in after member states. Compliance levels, issues arising and enforcement strategies. And it's been a very, very brilliant, very interesting one. I've learned a lot myself and I trust every one of you who has participated in this. I've also learned a lot as well. So please feel free. If you have any questions, you can always drop it. Just um, send an email to the organizers of this event and they'll be sure to get back to the panelists and get back to you as well. We hope to continue this tomorrow and I'll be handing over to the um, anchor of this event right now. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yemi Adiniron, Olatunji, and of course, Olumide Babalola, who had to leave us at some point during the call. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You. Pleasure. Right, you Yemi. Good. All right. Uh, Lulike, great to meet you guys. Yeah, I've been yeah. in touch. So over to you, Stella. Thank you to panelists, to the panelists on the second session and the moderator. It was quite an engaging, insightful, and enlightening session. I want to thank you for sharing from your wealth of knowledge. That was really, really um, an exciting one for each and every one of us. And I also want to say a very big thank you to our participants. Thank you for engaging. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for sharing your opinion in the comment session. We're grateful. Thank you for staying through from the beginning up until now. We do not take your presence for granted. Okay, we also want to thank and you know celebrate our sponsors, 22, 21 Search, Tax Tech, NDP Academy, AO2 Law, who has graciously given us their office space to use, Tax Age, TGL, First Fiduciary, and Africa Business Radio. We would also like to thank our supporters, Nita, Promasido, Crowd Divest, Layer 3, um, CATS, iCentral, MultiChoice, Banwo, and Godalo, International Electronic Services, and Leadway Pension. I want to thank you for supporting us in every way that we have requested. And this is also to remind each and every one of us, especially the participants, that if you have any questions, any comments, suggestions, or feedback that you'd like us to implement, kindly send this to the email that would be placed in the chat box. This is also to let our participants know that if you would like to learn further or know more about data protection, data privacy, and whatever nomenclature you've heard today, it is important that you read our quarterly reports. The link to these reports would be shared in the chat box. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for staying tuned from the onset till now. We do not take you for granted. Thank you so much. Hope to see you tomorrow. This continues tomorrow, same time tomorrow, nine o'clock. Thank you. And do not forget to share with your friends and everyone that you think should be connected to this program. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.